hello i think that we're i think that we're streaming i'm going to do a proper intro in a second but i want to make sure that people can hear us all first we should have gone live with happy birthday jacques cousteau <laughs> happy birthday jacques cousteau <laughs> and your depressing quote does anyone remember jacques cousteau dying yes Wait, no yeah no no, I don't. I, I was like five. That was my fifth birthday when he died. Oh, you're so young. He died on my birthday. Was that like five a birthday celebration? You went and murdered Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Can we talk about air, please? It escalated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was three what? when this happened. Oh, I don't remember. You're all <laughs> so young. <laughs> yeah, I was in middle school. Yeah, and uh, I do uh, feel like I was about to turn um, thirty. I may have been about to go to Australia. <gasps> actually to meet Jacques Cousteau to meet Jacques Cousteau but then he died so that's how it goes oh, wow. I guess because yeah. Keith killed him why did Jacques Cousteau die to keep Austin from meeting him that's right <laughs> damn the Butterfly Flex 4 is wild extremely extremely messed up IMO All Look, right. I don't have any special insights into the timeline <laughs> What's great all. is that nobody knows why we're talking about Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> people can people who are tuned in can can yeah. get can get into there, it. I think. Yeah, exactly. Real Cousteau heads know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Seems like people can hear us, I think. Unless I love like Custodians. A... Anyway. Yeah. They're like Cousteau with gu with gusto. No, oh, never mind. Is Cousteau related to Couteau, the French word for knife? Yes, because he died have by an stabbing. Accent over the, I think he died of being born in 1910. But yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that, makes sense. <laughs> that makes perfect body. That makes perfect sense. All right. Welcome oh, to friends at the. Mm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. There might be some echo in the chat. No, I think that's one person's echo. It was a okay. bunch of other people are saying there is no echo. So. Oh, uh, mea culpa. All right. Mm -hmm. Yep, that person had two tabs open. That'll do it. <laughs> I'll do her. I'll do it. Welcome to Friends at the Table, an actual play podcast focused on critical world building, smart characterization, and fun interaction between good friends. I'm your host, Austin Walker, and joining me today, Ali Akampora. Um, hi, I'm Ali. You can find me over at Ali underscore Wes on Twitter, and the show is over at Friends underscore Table. Keith Carberry. Uh, hi, my name is Keith J. Carberry. You can find me on Twitter at Keith J. Carberry, and you can find the Let's Plays that I do at youtube.com slash run button. Uh, we just started Metal Gear Solid 3. Amazing. Sylvie Claire. Hey, I'm Sylvia. You can find me on Twitter at Sylvie Bulla, and you can find my other show. I need to actually be specific about this because I forgot that we changed the way the podcast feed is listed. Oh. If you search for just Emoji Drome, it's the old one. You oh. need to search for Emoji Drome 2.0 because we couldn't think of anything better to name it. Mm. So. Oh, <laughs> is this why my my podcast feed hasn't updated in like eight months? Yeah, the company that hosted our podcast uh, died, and oh my God. we couldn't transfer anything. Yeah, no, oh, it's been a weird thing. Everyone yeah. go follow Emoji Drum 2.0. I'm doing it right now. There you go. Wow. I just assumed like the Jack. podcast went on, on hold. I had no idea. No, it's like, this happens because we're both disasters, but that's mm -hmm. separate from the technical issues. Yeah, fair enough. Jack DeKeet. Hi there, I'm Jack. You can find me on Twitter at NotQuiteReal and buy any of the music featured on the show at NotQuiteReal.Bandcamp.com. Janine Hawkins. Hi, I'm Janine. You can find me at BleatingHeart on Twitter. Art Martinez Tebel. Hey, you can find me on Twitter at A Tebel. And Andrew Lee Swan. Hey, you can find me on Twitter at Swandre3000. As always, you can support the show by going to friends at the table cash. If you uh, liked Sanfiel and wanted to hear us talk about it during the season, we have a show called Drawing Maps. You can do that during. We have a ton of additional uh, actual play content from years of doing a show called Bluff City. We have lives at the table, which we'll be pivoting back to in a moment because we need to get uh, some more Road to Palisade going ASAP. Though actually we have one in the can. Um, I guess we've said this on Patreon. Long content. One too. It's a pretty long one. We did a Ooh. Dre GM'd Lancer game set in the the universe of the the uh, Principality, and that was an extremely fun game. I was excited to play as a player. Uh, Dre did an incredible job as GM. Uh, they were great. It was a really fun game. So look forward to that going into the feed in the near future. We had Bluff City in the can. That'll be coming out soonish also once we get some uh, lockdown on music and narration. Um, so look forward to, to some more stuff in that feed shortly. 
Today, we are doing the postmortem for Saint Fiel, uh, a game that we played with, uh, the season that we played with the following games The Ground Itself by Everest Pipkin, Heart the City Beneath by Grant Howitt and Christopher Taylor, Inhuman Conditions by Tommy Moranges and Corey O'Brien, uh, Icker Drowned by Cillian L. and Brendan McLeod, uh, Anamnesis by Samantha Lee, and A Visit to San Sibilia by Peter, Edge, uh, Peter Ike. <clears throat> Uh, I believe that's everything. It's truly possible that we missed a game we played this season somehow. Um, uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's the big stuff. We got a ton of questions. Allie, if you counted individual questions, I'm, I'm guessing this is true. You you did most of the the pulling stuff from the tips email. A hundred plus questions. Easy, easy, right? Yeah. I think that that's probably right. We cannot get through 100 questions. <laughs> Allie did a very good job of collating those, picking out the stuff that we got uh, like various versions of. Um, you know, a lot of people asked, how was Heart to play, for instance, and similar <laughs> things. We focused in on those questions. We focused in on questions that, that um, uh, we, we saw a lot of people kind of interested in. That way we could uh, get the most out of our time, which is increasingly limited. It's very funny to think about where we were like seven years ago with a postmortem where it was like, all right, it's going to be six hours long because we all have six hours of time. And now we all have pets and families and houses. And I don't have any of those things, but you know, we collectively yeah. do. <laughs> and in a hundred years, we'll all be dead. That's what, what Jacques Cousteau says. says. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Just like the kids' song, in a hundred years we'll be dead, just uh -huh. like Jack says. Jack says. Uh -huh. All right, let's just jump into the first one. This one came, comes in from Anonymous, but also, again, a lot of folks had this to ask. What is everyone's favorite single moment from the season? This is a big one. S and Marn working on the riverboat to get doing their like co working, like research, <laughs> book writing, uh, uh -huh, brunch uh -huh. kind of stuff was great. I loved it. Hell yeah. I liked it when uh, Duval uh, obliterated a bunch of painting monsters uh, in one of <laughs> Art's first roles in the entire season. They were um, resin monsters, thank you very much. They painting were resin monsters, monsters from Twilight Mirage. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> These are like paint thinner monsters somehow. Oh, I see. Okay, paint thinner monsters. I think it's very funny when uh, we have a suspicion that the mechanics can do a thing. Yeah. Uh, but we're not sure whether they will. And then seeing it executed so violently and spectacularly so early in the season was really funny. No one ever did more damage than that, even close. Not even close. <laughs> not even close. Not even close. I think Art maybe hit a, a similar thing once that was like 13 damage and it was still a big deal, but like, yeah, that's an unbelievable amount of damage in that moment. Yeah, that was great. Any other big favorite moments? I mean, uh, the, easy. oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. <laughs> you heard me about to, to uh, Virtue becoming the vampire <laughs> queen of Zapadia mm. was, uh, <laughs> was a highlight. Yeah, you saved one. me yeah. from being the one to say it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do have another one. So people don't think I'm as obsessed with myself as I am. <laughs> um, I really liked the uh, Red Zephyr arc, the like reveal at the end with Kaylin and stuff. Oh, um, God. I think that's oh, just some yeah. of my yeah. favorite stuff that we've done on the show. Yeah, um, I love that arc. Yeah. God, I don't. It's really hard for me to pick one because I, here's my my answer is like generic, and it's every time a player made a big swing. So that is Marn and Pikmin kidnapping a cop uh, <laughs> and threatening him. Uh, that is oh, that Chine beating up a doppelganger of himself or of themselves. Um, I guess Chine. Chine was he they. Um, uh, that is, um, uh, the moment in, in bell metal where like hits the thing of like, I know what's happening here, but I can't, I can't just, Oh, that was great. I can't make it happen. I can't just like make the truth be accepted by these people. Um, but like the confrontation at the top of the stairwell is so good. All anytime anybody makes like s deciding that i mean that's who ended up doing a lot of damage was the end of the season was s becoming <laughs> unparalleled sniper and and <laughs> stealth uh you know assassin um all of that stuff was was really fun all the way through so i think that those are my my faves i have a hard time not just saying everyone's vignettes 
Like, yeah, there really eight was episodes so good. of the show. Yeah. So oh, yeah, my good. actual one is every time we pulled a fucking Joker <laughs> <laughs> at the end. Yeah. Um, no, I was really happy with all of those all the way through, and each had a moment of the season for me in each case, so... Oh, uh, I just thought of mine, which was Duvall meeting the captain on the on the oh, ship. Oh, oh that yeah. was a great. That conversation yeah. so fun. The hor- horrible bug room. Uh huh. Yeah. That some of us were going to try to go into. I'm and Austin so was worried. Like, I was you probably so shouldn't. You yeah. really shouldn't. <laughs> you, Austin explicitly said, "This will kill you if you're not Duvall." Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I just, and it might even kill Duvall. It might <laughs> even kill Duvall. Yeah. Maybe it did. Maybe it did. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Something to think yeah. about for next next uh-huh. uh, next. Time. <laughs> I thought um, uh, Bell Metal Crew finally getting turned into the airship was just miserable. That was one of my favorite like horror beats of like, yep, the uh, the plan kept. Uh, Kalen's plan working, and the people who had said no, Kalen's our buddy. This is not you're, you're talking nonsense. Just eventually got turned into an airship. Um, Oh, yeah. Was was very little, unpleasant. The little and good. plaque commemorating them. <laughs> so, so gross. I hate Kalen. Kalen's one of my favorite terrible people to have played. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, so because nasty. I don't have to. Pl- I, I get to. I get to play him as a little worm when he, as you would, as you <laughs> would say, Jack, um, on screen. But like, I don't. All of the truly terrible stuff is finding evidence of it. You know, it's finding yeah. the, the places and and stuff. Um, finding finding what happened, talking to people who who were hurt by Kalen. So, uh, I like that quite a bit. Um, yes, Mitch in the chat says uh, like pulling up the ghost water cups so that Austin can fill it up. <laughs> That's a great like the way that the ghost water stuff pays off in Roseroot Hall is really fun. Uh, oh my god, the skeletons, the, the, the skeletons, skeletons with the riddles, good, the riddle mm. skeletons, and then the come the return of Fendleton in yeah. in likes vignette finale um oh talking to a dark souls npc in the basement appleton, of the library yeah appleton the, oh, yeah. the whatever of whatever <laughs> the cards the, i forget what what ranking appleton has i have i have a list somewhere where appleton is in the uh rights of the seventh sun deck but then they're somewhere god some good oh, ones. Fa- oh, false war and true false <sighs> war. Those were. <laughs> those were great. And this is like uh, one of the funniest things to me is that like so many. We'll get some questions like momentarily about like how so much of this. It seemed like we were going to be in Blackwick in a real way uh, this season, and then we just weren't. We were there for like a little bit, and then some downtimes, and then the end. Um, and then, uh, but but so many of my favorite moments are things like being on the riverboat. And I don't think we get, we don't. I don't think we get false war and true false war <laughs> without being on a riverboat and me going. I bet they have some sort of weird, fun game I could come up with. You and know? then Keith's single-minded, spectacular insistence on being involved with the tournament. I just love the asterisk on like was poised to win it and didn't get the chance to. And this is my. This is what because I he hope. misunderstood oh. how the boat worked. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Yes. They said, "Don't leave the boat." They did say no. Don't leave the boat. The they boat. did say don't oh, leave they the didn't boat. Say the boat was just gonna keep chugging along. <laughs> That's what, That's what boats, boats do. <laughs> hey. I thought uh, it was gonna be a three day pause. Oh yeah, and saying afraid notes. As someone mentioned, Pikmin getting a capitalist unalived yet. No, fucking Pikmin <laughs> just getting uh, Dayward's Eve killed uh, very simply and easily, and walking <laughs> oh, away yeah. from it is so fun this is that that to me is the payoff to every book that's ever told me to look at my characters through the crosshairs of a gun and like be willing to kill off my own npcs because it's good it's so so good that that just happened that way you know you have to make some roles you have to like line it up you have to have you knew the right person you asked the right person it worked and it was great so uh, um yeah i i i it is it is we will talk about the like difficulties that I, at least I and I suspect some others had with the season but looking at it like z- zooming back and looking at it from a, a wide view and thinking about all these different moments I'm very happy with a lot of the story beats that we had so um, should we advance should we keep on moving here sure I'm gonna do it uh, Dre do you want to read this one from Dahlia yeah let me get to the right tab okay. uh this season was something really special and new that you all haven't done before and i want to thank you for working so hard to create an incredible show thank, thank you, you dahlia 
Uh, I want to ask about the production of Sang Fiel as the first season of Fat created start to finish in the COVID-19 era and a season in which you tried a system very unlike the games you played previously. I'm sure it came with a lot of difficulties. Y'all made no secret that figuring out the finale was a difficult process. And the start of the season came in hot very shortly after the end of Partisan. Can you talk a little about that and any other challenges of note you faced throughout all the best, Dahlia? Yeah, that's a, it was it is the first like partisan started pre COVID. Um, and when I say started, I don't just mean it started coming out. But like I was hunkered down in cafes writing up the big uh, drawing maps, descriptions of the various factions, the various like big five, the five stells. Um, I was I was prepping so much material. I was in I was in the world preparing for partisan right um and that's how i make things i'm very bad at working at my desk at my house um it is very hard for me to do most types of work except for live production work like doing a show or doing a podcast this is my podcasting space it is not a writing space right um and that is difficult uh and so even bef even partisan not just had its runtime being partly pre-covid um, but also it's prep time being free COVID and that was huge. And also I prepped for partisan for like a year, right? Like I knew we were building to partisan before we were done Twilight Mirage. And so certain gears were turning that, that early. Safiel, we've talked about this at this point, but like we had vibes and various broad ideas, but like we did not have Safiel when we finished partisan or maybe very very like maybe by the time the final partisan episode came out we were there um but we didn't we certainly didn't have a name we certainly didn't have more than gothic horror weird west tr haunted trains maybe you know a lot of our early stuff was like i've said this before but it's like there's a video of um the first thing that was prepping for saint fiel was me linking a video of a not the blood starved beast one of the one of, there's an npc in, oh, in bloodborne yes. who is who is a creepy guy and if you talk to him enough times and find him enough times he turns into a monster and then you know does the thing of saying hunters are the real monsters like how how dare you da, 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 da. and i was like oh yeah we should do that season that's a season we could do um <laughs> and we had lots of different ideas um, we of did. it well, yeah we end. did in the I end think, we, we in the end that video we did get to that video <laughs> um <laughs> We had versions of this. I, 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 you know, I say we. Really, it was like, I, I don't like to torture everybody at once by dropping tons of like inspirational images and stuff into a chat with all eight of us because that's like sometimes it seriously is a year out before anyone else needs to start thinking about this stuff. Um, but I do subject Ali as the producer to it, and then Jack as the composer shortly after. And so, Ali, you and I were talking about like. Could we do a season where there's like vampires in the center of a continent or like a big gothic city in the center of a continent and the outskirts are kind of like chill and there's like haunted forests in between and traveling is a big deal and you could be a we, we had we pitched a thing that was like um what if your magic students like 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 vampire huntery witch students um uh going on like do it like doing your grad seminar doing your like your um your final <laughs> field your, work. your dissertation p you know uh, uh research yeah your field work basically we didn't do that yeah. we did something else but I, I think one of the first things i said was like the a screen cap from final fantasy 9 uh -huh, of the sure. like gate city that you go to and it's like what if like travel was restricted to the point that like we had these big like big roads and big like gates that you had to go through and it was like yeah that was fun to think about at the time. yeah we went through a lot of variation and then we didn't know what game to play and again i very <sighs> much i know listen we'll talk we have other questions about this coming in we'll talk about that process <laughs> at some point um uh but yeah it was it was that was all pre difficulties and then COVID happened and we had to make a season oh, i'm curious for y'all how that felt in terms of character creation staying focused making a season about some like heavy stuff and dark at least you know dark and gruesome stuff maybe not as heavy as partisan in some ways i when the pandemic sort of uh, had started and had been rumbling along for a bit there was a bit of me that was like well 
I usually sit at home and work by talking into a microphone and plan with my friends. So I'm very lucky that the pandemic isn't going to <laughs> impact my work. Right. Uh, and then the longer that happened, the more I was like, oh God, it is, it yep. is impacting my work. Mm -hmm. um, in the way that, you know, in the way that Austin describes about being able to get out of our houses and sit and think. In the way that like, you know, uh, because of my visa problems, I wasn't able to do it with Partizan. But a lot of the early seasons, Austin and Ali and I would mm -hmm. sit in a cafe or in a restaurant in the early days of a season and just be like, okay, what the hell are we interested in making? Yep. Um, and that's just gone. Um, and all the sort of bits of, of the practice that I had grown comfortable with uh, over the years of doing this before the pandemic had just sort of fallen away. Mm -hmm. um, and all the, the, the only bit that was left was you sit down at your desk or in front of your instruments and you try and make friends at the table. And that was exhausting. And then the exhaustion of watching everybody get sick and get saying. ill and yeah. die. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the thing of uh. being like, even outside of work, going, oh, the world is sick and people aren't doing what they need to do or like the, the people who could change things aren't changing anything yeah um and that just as it as it has for everybody in every level uh and for some more than others just ground me down over the course of the season um and i th I, I can only speak for myself but i am still reckoning with that oh yeah and still i am still in the hole as it were um <laughs> i'm trying to figure out what that means mm-hmm Anyone else have, have strong COVID production feelings? Yeah, I think that COVID affected me not at all. Oh, okay. And that's why <laughs> I made the a best character, character that is a community all into himself. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, oh, and yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I didn't really think about it until this question came to me. But, like, of course it is, right? And, and it's all of the ways and it's all of... You know, it's seeing the horror in the real world that that makes you create fantastic horror to to reckon with it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 all of these things. Yeah, for sure. Um, also interesting, I think. I wondered to some degree if when I was so insistent on this being an episodic season, um, if it came from me from knowing I wouldn't have that time. I mean, I'd wanted to try an episodic season for a minute anyway, on and off. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some like false starts with Quest, which I still want to get back to at some point, um, which I, I, I've seen some people ask, like, why haven't we ever gone back to Quest on the Patreon? And the answer truly is because of scheduling concerns and like not having, not having, it turns out needing X group of people for a live, a live the table is way harder than just grabbing whoever's around to do a thing um uh which which got in the way of, of expanding on quest which i really want to get back to at some point but i i've wanted to do this episodic style thing for a long time but i really think knowing that i wouldn't be able to go ruminate somewhere about big faction maneuvers um uh and feeling like i wanted a show that was a little easier to make from everybody's perspective now we'll talk about whether that was true or not later. Um, but the idea being players don't have to worry as much about, about what's going on in that kind of faction tier view or po politically, right? Um, like politically in the world, not politically in meaning making. Um, I don't have to worry as much about um, setting up long-term conflicts, et cetera. Uh, I can just, we can just focus on kind of monster of the week style hauntings and, and misadventures. Um, and I think it was almost a decision made at least partially because I knew COVID wasn't going to allow for me to be as into that other production process as, as it was. Um, uh, and again, we'll, we'll talk about how we stuck with that or didn't stick with that and why that changed and how it went in general, uh, I think with some other questions, but um, anybody else feel like art did that the COVID stuff shifted how they thought about their characters? Ali, you, you know, um. you, you played a doctor um, and, a, <laughs> and a caregiver. I'm curious if you yeah. thought about that at all. I mean, Marn was such a such a response to like what I had seen and like learned through community efforts through just like mm. looking at what was happening through the COVID era and the like the thing of like if you're gonna give twenty dollars to someone, it should not be to like this big organized yes. fundraising. It should be to somebody who's gonna buy fifteen sandwiches and mm -hmm. give them to people, right? And like that was sort of my thesis for Marn. Um, 
right? This was yeah. not just the COVID era. It was also, you know, we, we were we were prepping for this uh, after the George Floyd stuff, right? Um, after the killing mm-hmm. of George Floyd, the various um, Black Lives Matter uprisings across the country, um, the season itself, you know, postdates those. Uh, and in fact, I would say that like the season itself exists in a period of uh, reactionary vibe shift, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> um, that has been frustrating, uh, but uh, I do think that that yeah, like I think mutual aid was definitely top of mind when we were talking about Marn in the preseason, in the preseason, you know, like in football, like a football preseason. But uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, training. we're doing two days, and <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Sylvie, you were going to start. You were going to say something also here. Uh, it just it not to be like the most cynical but it really didn't make it easy to be a total piece of shit seeing how people were acting during all this like with virtue deeply selfish oh yeah yeah tons of role models to be (laughs) for like someone who doesn't have any regard for human life um and also people who are just like really (laughs) power greedy and shit yeah you know it 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 just made it like I think that's kind of it is just like it made me a bit more like cynical about people as a whole and that came out in the season a lot yeah i think that that's fair um any other um do we talk about finale now or do you want to save that because someone else does someone else does ask this so let's just wait uh, yeah i really wanted this to be our covid and then enter hell yeah exactly (laughs) um uh jack presumably a different jack writes in and says this is the first season that you've explored horror elements did it go how you expected what was the tone you expected it to be or did you expect it to be lighter darker weirder less weird etc keith you had mentioned uh, in a comment on our big kind of uh question page yeah um that you're not a horror person outside of no. i guess the silent hill streams that you've done <laughs> right yeah um and i and the it doesn't it doesn't feel horror stuff scares me so i don't watch it or read well i guess i also grew up reading you're a stephen, stephen king, king person yeah but it's it's vis, it's 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 horror as like a visual medium that mm-hmm. i don't know almost anything about uh the silent hill games that we've let's played are the pretty much the only horror games i've ever played um and they're so old that it, it doesn't feel like it counts um we're very rarely scared by anything that happens in those games uh and uh yeah so i just felt on the back foot kind of thematically mm-hmm. um and like uh like in terms of like you know we've all got like a pile of ideas that we can pull from and it just felt like this was my smallest pile yet well like it's like, really in uh, becoming the like cosmic horror stu- you know academic who becomes caught in a cult or a, a god beyond his means to control though right i feel like mm-hmm. actually like is is like the quintessential you know miskatonic university professor in some ways which is a horror adjacent thing i guess i know you've read some of those stories so yeah I'm curious if you were drawing on those um or if that just stumbled was something you it, kind of yeah it into. just sort of came out of it i i weirdly like uh i had i had so many characters in a row um the you know maybe gig is like the big exception um where it was like uh i just felt like my characters were always the the like um like the thorn of the group that everyone was getting mad at or that was getting mad at everyone mm-hmm. and i was like i just don't want to do that this season and that was really the only thing that I had going into the season besides being like a little, and that ended up absolutely not happening. I tried to make it happen. Like I genuinely was like literal thorn. The character's name is like, is the, (laughs) yeah. Uh, So the only thing that I went into the season was I just want to have a season where uh, my character doesn't want to leave the group and gets along with everybody. How that? How that? How that, uh, that turn out? It didn't. Oh. Didn't turn out. We'll get to that later. Also, not just chill vibes only. Oh. Chill, chill vibes only. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
a lot of people in the chat pointing out various moments in previous seasons that we've had horror stuff, the iconoclast in Twilight Mirage, motion in Partisan. I, I also think the um, the beginning of the auspice mission in Partisan, where like nothing is happening yet and everyone is is investigating oh, stuff, so and fun. Sylvie makes some decisions that are really great. Um, are like is, is really good, like usual. I think even High Run has had dark and, and horror tinged moments, but I think there's something different between that and it you know, isn't how Jack the emailer uh, phrased it, but between sitting down and saying we're going to make a season that is like a horror season. Um, uh, and obviously, again, uh, Bluff City, Blue City stuff has there's lots of horror elements in our Lacuna game, in Catch the Devil. Like we we we're play in horror spaces sometimes. Um, but I think there was, I think that there is something different and I'm curious if other people, maybe people who, unlike Keith, do have horror background felt like we got there and if, if so, how, and if not, why, etc. Um, I can, I'll be honest here and say that like, so, you know, I think historically I've gotten maybe too much credit for horror, for introducing horror elements into the show. Mm. Um, but at the at the same time as I'm going to say that, I'm also going to say like, to me, Songfiel didn't feel like the thing that felt different about Songfiel was more that I felt like I didn't need to be apologetic, and that also mm. you, when you were introducing those things, didn't have to be a like you could kind of just do the thing, you know. Um, and we could be like, you know, we're going to list, there's going to be like two dozen content warnings on the front of this episode, and you know, it is what it is, um, because like. Twilight Mirage is a good example. Like when I compare the kind of horror I was in, I've been engaging in in Songfiel with the kind of horror I was engaging in with Twilight Mirage, um, the way that like from character creation on, kind of like defining a bunch of stuff and and all of that, like it's a lot of similar stuff and and you know things that were used in similar ways and like I would absolutely not shy away from saying that Twilight Mirage had horror. You know, mm -hmm. and a lot of that horror was centered around Signet. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 one of Signet's most like elegant things was a living bug jewel computer thing. Like, mm -hmm. there, there's always like some sort of I don't know. There's there's a lot of that of just like I think the big difference was just that um, I didn't have to you know, in those previous things, I felt like I was always kind of saying, like, I know everyone's going to hate this, but here's this thing. You know, a good example uh, would be uh, Teasel Mode um, mm -hmm. doing the blood stuff. Yeah. Um, I was, like, extremely apologetic going into that, but I wanted to do it very badly. Um, and I guess the, you know, so the thing for me with Sunfield was just that I didn't have to feel as bad about doing it. It's funny you say that because I felt extremely... Um... I it took me half a season before I was willing to say the word blood this season probably right yeah or to describe it especially I I mentioned I I have not I don't know that I mentioned this publicly maybe in a drawing maps um, but early on in the season I messaged Jack while we were before I was gonna do the um, the yellow field arc the what is the actual name of that arc the candle factory hey, yeah but what's uh, it actually is it called? called the candle factory no no. Um... Yeah, it is. Is it just called the Candle Factory? It is. Okay, yes. Um, uh, and being like, uh, I'm struggling to come up with it with what this next set of monsters is. Um, uh, and I think I specifically asked if fla if if it was like too soon to do flower based monsters after this. doing yeah. the um, the what do you call it beast the the yellow, the white the white flower beast is that what's, what's the name of the, the mm -hmm. is that in the first ep, first mm -hmm. episode yeah, basically yeah. um uh and then like thinking through that conversation i like it was i don't even know that we actually talked for a long time but it just struck me that like i, I ended up going to wax right and i was like oh wax is interesting as like a material to do horror stuff from obviously that's not a novel thought um uh wax is a is a classic horror thing between the relationship to candles and the ways in which it's skin like but off right the way it's like corpsey um uh when you think about stuff like wax figures um uh, all that like this is, this is old shit um for us obviously also the way it, it subverts slumbos who is a fan fave um and so like that was like okay that's a good choice but i realized very quickly like oh I'm doing lots of things that let me stay away from saying the word blood, like let me st stay yeah. away from saying the word skin, 
but let me stay away from talking about people's bodies or bodies like that are made of the stuff our bodies are. Um, and I was constantly making choices like this in the early in the early days. And I still think you can do a horror story that way. In fact, I think the most horrific thing in the season, the thing that actually scares me, the way you know home invasion horror films still like really fuck me up, is the Gates Zapadia, right? Is like the incredible uh, unilateral power that someone else has over you in your future. Um, uh, that stuff is is scarier to me than anything else we did this season. I think partly that's because we weren't playing Heart, which is fundamentally an adventure game, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, so I think that that was that that is where it ends up, and it's also where I ended up taking the gloves off a little bit, right? If you then go and look at like the stuff that happens with Chine in Hark, the Citadel beneath, and even during the downtime in Woo! like the torture <laughs> that Chine goes through, the stuff that. Uh, uh, we, I end up the way I end up describing Catonia's transformation, the way I end up like all that stuff after that. It's like that was when my gloves came off in terms of being willing to describe fucked up shit. Um, so, so that was that was a big part for me. Any other big horror tone differences? Yeah, I feel like I kind of had some trouble finding my footing for the first little while, mm -hmm. you know, the, a similar way to you did. Um, the stuff I like from horror tends to be very gross, right. and I don't know, like, how much of it is going to play with our audience or on a podcast. Right. Um, I mean, I will say, so, like, right away, we saw, we saw a handful of people drop the Patreon because of... Not a, not a ton of people, not enough to make us go like, oh shit, I can't make rent this month. Uh, but we saw that, and it was like one of those things where like that fully, I don't know that I reported that to the rest of the crew at that point. I think maybe Allie and I were the only people who really saw it. But like, it was one of those I, moments I, that was like, are we scaring people away with, right, Art, you saw it too. Are we scaring people away with content warnings? Are content warnings misrepresenting how severe some of this stuff is? Like mostly we're all just laughing on a microphone still. Um, yeah. It was front of mind for me, and it did make me not get as gross the way that you're talking about Sophie. Yeah, like it just got in my head. So like, I feel like there's a lot of shit I left on the table with Virtue. And like, eventually I got to mention some of the stuff. Like, um, I think like right before um, she, I'm done playing her for the season, okay. I mentioned that she is like partially decomposing and stuff. Yeah, but like, totally. there's so much more I could have done with that. Yeah. And um, I think I got some of it with like the stuff with Hazard's head in there. I thought that was like, what some of the more like body horror stuff that I'm happy with, mm -hmm. but um, I think if we come back to this setting, I've got to take bigger swings at it. Yeah, I think that that's fair. I think that that's that's, and who knows how we come back to the setting? We might not. We might come back to the setting and it not be as horror themed or have horror be one thing that we touch on. Like we we don't know yet in that way. Okay. We'll play like a really like soft and sweet game, and I will make the grossest character possible. That's, <laughs> that's the play. That's the play. Uh, any other big horror thoughts? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, um, well, I was just going to say content warnings is an interesting thing because it's something that I really tried to think about in terms of like, I mean, a lot of times I would give Austin just like notes from the episode and be mm -hmm. like, should we tag this? Um, a lot or of how do we are, tag this a lot? Right, yeah. Uh, well, hmm. because it was just being like, I, wh where is the danger coming from, really? Um, on On my my level of of horror experience is like i enjoy horror but i'm kind of a scaredy cat and i <laughs> the more visceral a thing is the less i'll probably like it um mm -hmm. so just the just the 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 ground terms of terms of like here's what sort of wounds are in this episode so you can avoid it or like yeah. the bugs thing obviously but it, it especially going with the last question it, it was something that i took a lot of time on in the production side um just in terms of like needing to be like okay the only thing that i can think about today is like Ugh. is this a murder or not <laughs> um, right. so we can decide this later oh, and then i should like think about what i'm gonna do after this um instead mm -hmm. of like trying to do three different work things at once um and like i i mean i it's up to the audience how some of that stuff came across but yeah. like I did want to be careful about it just in terms of like, oh, what about listening to this is making me go mm. sort of like, uh -huh. wish you had said it like that. <laughs> um, versus like where in, in a game where like characters are getting hurt and like the situation is changing because this thing is happening. Um, like what, what would actually disturb someone versus it being like, 
Well, S transformed into a funny monster and is like dancing around now, which is like body transformation is a, a thing we should still tag, but like it's a triumphant moment for right. Nice and not mm-hmm. like, um, you know, a time where she's vulnerable. Right. Totally. Totally. And there's stuff that's like, are we, I think we try to be judici- judicious about the difference between something being mentioned and something being described or something being heavily described you know um uh, we're not a we are not a visual based medium uh as you may know uh but we do (laughs) we do still have that ability to zoom in and to to increase the kind of fidelity of description with words and sometimes i want to do that right like like and it tend i think by the end it was still the case that i was doing it more with wax monsters than bodies yeah. and human bodies because also i think the wax ended up taking on a really good i f- think i found the right groove for that to be creepy in other ways you know um so Jack, i, I was gonna like say especially else. with yeah. the with the wax um i think it was a it was a, it was like you say it austin it was a sign of us feeling feeling out the the horror aesthetic and, and the way of making a thing scary that that we were happy with uh the wax is such a good example of that because you know, um, Yellowfield scared me when I listened to it the first time, and and I thought it was it was really fun. Mm-hmm. But the thing that scared me in Yellowfield was sort of the the pervading weird dread and um, eyes, ears, and mouth walking mm-hmm. past the window, and Bucho as this waxy sort of um, scarecrow figure. Uh, and then by the time we brought the wax back for the for the Blackwick sort of finale, so pre finale. Um, I feel like we were all much more confident about how to describe yes, wax, yes. how to make wax. Like I think about, we basically drench Blackwick in yeah. wax in yeah. that arc in a way that um, uh, I don't know if you could also speak to this, Sylvie, in liking horror when it's gross. But uh, sometimes mm-hmm. um, I'm also like a I, I really like horror, and uh, some of my favorite stuff is when a production team just absolutely goes for it in terms yeah. of the mm-hmm. like scale and. Uh, less detail and more con- uh, quantity of whatever they're em- employing. <laughs> and, you know, I think that by the time we got to Blackwick and Pikmin was just covered in like drying wax and the buildings were dripping wax, we blew up the station and wax went everywhere. There were people uh, covered in wax shambling all around the town. It felt like this great um, sort of visceral explosion of what we had been sort of demoing earlier in, in Yellowfield is a much quieter arc um but more broadly i do definitely feel closer to what you were describing austin in terms of like in explicitly setting out to make a horror season i was constantly second guessing myself mm-hmm. about whether we could get away with describing this stuff or or whether we were going too far um and especially because there's there's there are a lot of us making this podcast and all of us have different um, tolerances and different feelings about horror and all of us are scared by different things um, mm-hmm. so it's very hard to have that kind of like clarity of viewpoint that sometimes makes horror work really well um, yeah. but it was a lot of fun to um, I know you and I had conversations pre Gates of Zapatia pre um, Pickman's interview yeah. where you know I've had a lot of recent uh, uh, real world traumatic contact with uh, Borders uh, and I think that through that conversation, the point I came to was basically, all right, give me both barrels, Austin. Let's make this really <laughs> Let's scary. Just do it. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I wouldn't want to take, I wouldn't want to make that choice for any other cast member, but I did like being in those moments in the season where in moments relating to me, I felt able to just be like, all right, okay, what's the worst you can do? Uh-huh. Let's do it. I will say also, I and mean, this is, this is a bigger mechanics thing that I think we'll, we'll get to throughout, but um, it was hard to make a horror season in a game where, despite the way it's written, players are ext- characters are extremely effective, especially when they work together at solving things. And also, players want to play super agentically and and aggressively. I think a lot about the beginning of Rosewood Hall, which in my mind was going to be a slow burn horror house or oh, haunted house so story, funny. and then like, but there wasn't even a single night spent there, right? Like. I think there's one night all set, right? The next morning, you were giving Dyer Road his head back. Um, like that was that yeah. The was, events happened, happened on that the first night, night on the first night, and it was one of those things where you can see. There's a particular moment where you can hear me 
letting go of the leash and being like, yeah, just, I guess just roll again. Like there is the stuff that is true about this place is true about this place. Or more importantly, if you're rolling to find stuff, I'm going to let you roll to find stuff. I'm not going to lie, you know, especially if you've done preliminary work, investigating stuff and just jumping into it. And it's just like, this is also hours after art obliterated three, you know, uh, uh, those monster goat creatures. Uh, and it's like, yeah, okay. They're just going to be, this is not, the system loans itself to resource scarcity and to it costing a lot to heal up. Um, uh, but I really had a hard time making it feel scary for you uh, as players. And part of that is we we were not playing that game to die. Like, um, I think if players, if both of, if both y'all and I were going into it with like, we should, we should probably kill some player characters throughout the season and people are getting excited about triggering zenith moves early or about just dying in gruesome ways early we maybe end up creating something that feels more like a traditional horror story um but we there we didn't that's not how it felt yeah. you know we didn't have well, PC death a... until the very end and it was not from it was not from heart basically at all there was a, a uh, i don't remember how long it lasted but there was a, a period at the beginning of playing the game where it felt like to me it felt like you know, people could die and we were going to play this, you know, this was going to be like a different kind of season where mm -hmm. like player death was on the table because of the game that we were playing. And just the longer we did it and pretty quickly, yeah. it started just just felt like another season of Friends at the Table, yep. which meant that people were playing their characters like their in characters. a world where they were not yeah. like looking for like, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer looking for like to die. Mm hmm. In a in a fun and interesting way, um, I don't know. Maybe if by chance we didn't make it out of that like early period with with zero deaths, it would have felt different for the rest of the season. Yeah. But uh, and I have no regrets about that. I don't feel like I don't feel like the season would have been better if like instead of having um, you know nine uh, PCs, we had is fourteen. Right. I think it would be an interesting thing. We've never done that, right? And so I think yeah. there, there would be... I'm curious how that would have gone, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, but I think that, you know, the thing is, the way death works in in Heart is you get a critical fallout, and you tend to get a critical fallout when you already have multiple major fallouts, and they combine into a critical fallout. And that moment is always a moment of negotiation, and often, you know, the book gives a bunch of different answers to how it gets triggered, but it's a play... A player can always suggest it uh I, or, or say it happens a player can always say my two major fallouts combine and i get this sick critical fallout um and i say sick because it, the fallouts that we've never there's an entire type of fallout we never saw in this game that mm. have a bunch besides even just the zenith moves that are about death but things like um what's the one i always here uh, uh here's one an echo an echo critical fallout descent the next time you're in a landmark the ground shakes as the heart draws you and the place further down move the landmark and anyone in it to the next available space on the tier below this is catastrophic most people will not survive you're swallowed up by the heart and retire as a player character immediate uh and it's like that's sick. That never happened for us because we just don't play that way. Uh, but I think that's a an important mismatch when it came to in, embodying horror in this way because consequences were limited. Um, we weren't burning through characters in the way that a lot of horror stories would have done with a cast this big, you know. Um, uh, but it's why I ended up thinking that things like the uh, the stuff that's strong is stuff like the stuff that happens to Chine underneath. Uh, a Sapodilla, the Sapodilla entrance, Marrow Creek, where it's playing in the surreal and confusing space. That's everything's kind of um, there's a, there's an air of threat in the air because it feels like the ground is suddenly shaky, you know. Um, but yeah. Um, all right, I'm gonna keep moving. Uh, Janine, can you read this one from Anonymous? Yeah. Uh, oops. It's pretty clear how driven the characters are mechanically by beats and how that helps to drive the narrative in wonderful and unexpected ways. And there are a few times players take beats without a clear intention of what path uh, they want to take to get there. Duval's chase for the painting springs, springs to mind here, originating from the beat, acquire a renowned piece of equipment. Uh, 
So the question I have is how did the players go about picking beats both early in the season and later into it? And how often were you picking beats that had no immediate clear path in the fiction as it stood at that moment of being accomplished? Good question. I don't pick beats, so I can't answer this one. <laughs> uh, um, I have a very easy uh, methodology here. It's how I live most of my life. It's what will get me into the most trouble in the yeah. most fun way. Um, <laughs> It was just like what seems like it would cause some shit. Occasionally it was like I need to do a thing mechanically or I need to just like get this thing on my character sheet so I can do more fun stuff with my character. And that would be just like su the ones where it's like suffer this type of fallout or whatever. But like the I think the one with like virtue where it was like steal a piece of knowledge or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. What led to her taking the mother beast tome that was like specifically chosen because i was like i want to have her causing trouble for people immediately yes uh, <laughs> yeah and that ended up being a really good resource an interesting resource the, the way it got moved around over the course yeah. of that the early season other beats uh, uh other strategies for picking beats just pick the coolest beat yeah. let's pick the coolest beat yeah i mean there's a little bit of like targeting major or minor based on like the next advancement you want but mm -hmm. once you've picked a category just pick the coolest beat um yeah there's also a little bit of consideration of like where are we going to yeah like mm -hmm. are we going to a place where it feels like i can do this does it feel does it feel like there's a there's a, gonna be a cliff that i could kick someone off <laughs> and normally <laughs> oh, the thing that, that ends up happening funny. was i'd be like oh i don't know if there's gonna be any cliffs there and then i'd go well wait I I bet I could. Yeah, like, Ali, still miss it. you and I would be like, Ali, you pitched me a thing a few times, and I'd be like, well, I'll, you know what, I'll figure it out. Take the one you want. I'll try to fit it in there somewhere. And then, yeah, Keith, that's the thing, right? Is like that Kalen story. All almost I, all of almost all myself. of Bell Metal Station, like Bell Metal Station, exists because you have a beat that is, I need to kick someone off of a high thing, and they just they really deserve it. I'm like, <laughs> who the fuck? What? Okay, what and what does did, there need to and be? And he really deserved it. Yeah, hundred percent. Really, I thought and it, it would does. happen. Yeah, someone should go find him between, and pick him up a high thing. Um, between this and oh my god, what's the name of the city in Hyron, the ghost city? Uh, Naker. Naker. Yeah. Between this and Naker, Keith has really willed some weird shit yes, into existence. Totally. <laughs> totally. That's how it works. Like, I mean, that's the joy for me of the beat system. God, is yeah. there's <laughs> lots of stuff that is like you're giving me prep prompts right like Sanfiel does not oh, exist yeah. in that way where it's like here's a complete map which is part of the struggle with me and heart honestly is um during the evaluation of what game should we play one of my big notes was "Ooh, heart really reads like it works best if you have a bunch of places that you can just pull from a list that seem like a cool place to go to next and i don't think i'm gonna have the time to prep in that way to make a hundred cool places or eight eighty cool places or something. Uh this could bite me in the ass because I'll have to make stuff every time. It mostly didn't in the sense that the beats let me figure out what I should build next. Um but it did it I did always feel pretty bad about not having stuff prepped or having a good idea of what Sanfiel was in my mind. Uh, in that big picture way, because it is a game about moving from place to place and not having that in my back pocket always made me feel unprepped um, in terms of uh, this is kind of an answer to how this connects to my stuff in terms of beats. Anyway, other other beat stuff. It was um, interesting. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. It was interesting um, picking a calling so early in yeah. development. And and this is deliberate. This isn't this isn't me being like, oh, I wish that uh, you know we'd picked a calling after spending a little more time with the characters. I, I liked that feeling, but it was really interesting making a shape night and and you know looking at how a shape night works and then sort of being like, the calling that I pick is going to define the kind of character I am, and I don't I I don't know how that's going to play out yet. Right. In the same way that when I pick shape night, I know roughly how the character is going to behave. I know roughly what tools are available to me. Um, I'd had this idea of like a very blunt character from the start. So I was like, great, that's fine. But then picking um, the, uh, I think it's the heart song calling. Is that the name of it? Heart song? Yep. Heart. Yeah. 
um, was like, oh, so this this person's going to be a weirdo, uh, <laughs> and this person's going to be unorthodox, and this person is going to try and come into contact with bits of the heart in a way that might not otherwise. And it was really interesting having to make that call. Sorry, there's the an jump. extremely loud car outside. It's Someone gone, is though. doing the races. And that's yeah, that's um, the racing by. <laughs> Can you say that last bit one more time, Jack? It was really interesting having to pick that from the jump. Um, right. And it's such a big, I mean, lots of people I felt like were struggling with which of these things fits my character concept, Yeah, you know? Which again, I think is part of the way we often do things versus maybe the way Hart intends, which is, this is a very, I think we maybe, we, do we play more fast and loose with these characters if no one has a, has a concept and instead comes to the table and goes, ah, uh, I guess I'll be an enlightenment hound. And that's the thing I want. And then, like, you're just a hound. You don't have to... You don't have that ownership because it's not yours, right? You didn't help invent it. Uh, but this is, like, not how we tend to do things. And instead, everybody kind of invented their own part of this setting during character creation. And I wonder how much that ends up, you know, um, adding to that sense of, like, well, I'm not going to fucking die over nothing. Like, this isn't the right moment to die. I'll, if there's a moment to die, I'll, I'll happily die in a big, dramatic way. But it's not this. Whereas Hart wants any moment to be a moment to die, you know? Um, sorry, who else? Someone else did have a beat today. Was it Janine? Was it? Yeah, um, I was going to say that, like, early on for me, it was all about, or it was mostly about picking beats that I thought were fun. Like, mm -hmm. I thought it would be fun for S to write sort of her experiences out and, and like, publish them or whatever. That would be, that would be enjoyable. Um, as the season progressed, especially because we weren't sure if we were going to be ending, like yeah. we had to, we had a point where it's like every section, was, every every session was like, is this the end? I don't yep, know. Totally. Um, and way earlier point, than people might think. Yes. Yeah. And at, at that point, it became more of a thing of like, well, what do I think I can get done? Because I don't want to have, I don't want to have a thing left over where I've like banked half the progress I need in right. it, and then we switch systems, and it doesn't fucking matter. Um, so I hit this point where I was just, I was mostly picking the things that felt like they could get done. And that was, I was, you know, I had built a, I had very much built a character where I was prepared for Syntyche to die and S to persist in some way. Mm -hmm. Like I had, that was, that was how I had reconciled. Like, this is a game about character death. Um, this is fine. This is how I'll do it. Like I had that plan. Um, and it just, by the time that I was ready to consider Zenith moves, none of them felt like I could get them before a before we were in mm -hmm. finale territory. And at that point, I was like, "Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna die if I don't have a Zenith move. That's a waste." Mm -hmm. um, so then I just didn't bother pursuing those, right? Um, which I think is a problem that's fairly unique to like making a show out of a game. Probably, but yeah, is, that's a huge is part of it. Kind of relevant yeah. to the issue. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, the, 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 some uh, people, multiple people wrote in about basically why we didn't use any Zenith moves or I saw it pop up on a number of questions and the answer is no one had any Zenith beats completed, right? Like you can't, um, uh, somebody asked about particularly why Chine didn't use wield and woe, which is a, um, a cleaver Zenith move. And the answer is Chine had never completed a Zen Chine had a Zenith beat, but never completed that Zenith beat. And so you don't get to just do that thing without having that beat complete yeah. and having chosen the move too so um I kind of yeah we like, like to play thing... with the rules but not that much right, right, <laughs> right. i kind of feel like a thing that would have helped i don't know if this would help a normal game of heart but i think a thing that would have helped our game of heart is if there were there were three beat slots two of them that function mm. the way that they currently do and one that was reserved just for a zenith beat and like maybe you don't right. have to put a zenith in beat there. in there yeah, yeah, but yeah. you can have it in there and yep. there's nothing else that can go in that slot so it just feels so you could pick that at the very start and just have that going if you want to i think yeah, that would have you know that's um kind of tampers with the idea but you know yeah we had a we had a i don't know Austin, if you remember, mm -hmm. we did have a Zenith beat fake out right at the very end where yeah. we were still not sure how anything was going to end. And we thought that there was a way to get me a Zenith ability without having done a Zenith beat by doing a like a move swap. But yeah, that, was, up, that was not not how, how it was we written, were. actually. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, during the very long period of of being like, what happens? 
Great question. Yeah, I yeah, might be about to get to that question. That? I don't know. Maybe I use a Zenith beat and solve it, or a Zenith and, move and solve everything. And solve everything. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Um, I was like upset at my own set of Zenith beats, and that the Zenith beat wanted me to pick the answer to the question that I was asking mm -hmm. before doing the legwork to get there. And I mean, we could have house ruled it, of course. Yeah, yeah. but like. I don't know. It, it made me it made me resentful and wary of the Zenith. <laughs> <laughs> your stuff. enlightenment, right? And so the, your two choices are find the final secret you've so desperately sought for and use it to solve your impossible task, or find the final secret you've so desperately sought and destroy it so no one else can know of it. Which I think is a yeah. very fascinating thing for Duval to have done if if that had happened, like finding an answer and then solving an impossible task because what what's the impossible task that's fascinating or destroying it especially seemed really neat but i do understand in your mind it's like the zenith using the zenith is how you get the answer in a weird way in your head versus or tell me what it is and then i can decide if i'm gonna destroy or destroy right. it or not but right. that's not how it and again we right. could have yeah figured yeah, it out but like i didn't like the way they were making me deal with the question you know yeah totally mine were weird mine were um lead a haven to prosperity and we had done some negative work on that yeah uh and reach tier four for the heart which honestly seems easy and we might have done you did it know. you just didn't have the beat at the time like, yeah. when you were in marrow creek and everything went bad you were in tier four very briefly that would have yeah. hit that but you didn't have that beat right so yeah. that's that's the other half of that beat system right um also it's worth saying Everybody leveled up way more than the average heart character <laughs> does. Um, I, I have no idea where even this the, uh, this information is, where I t where it is in the book. But somewhere in the book, somewhere in the book, they say straight up like, um, yeah, eight. They they suggest the book suggests that the game should be run for eight sessions. Um, uh, <laughs> which we just even on one side blew past. Um, and and became by the end very very powerful characters for having so many tools available. You know, I think I played my characters for eight sessions. I think that's right. I think that's probably about right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I win. There you go. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna keep moving unless someone has a final beat thought. We still have a bunch of questions. Um, I'll read this one. This is from Rosecrest and also LP. This is another one that we got a bunch of people write in about. Uh, from various perspectives. I wanted to read these two because I think it, it hits it in, from slightly two different directions. Um, Rosecrest says, uh, it was really fascinating to me how emotionally distanced the PCs were to each other this season. There were, of course, some moments of connection that really stood out, such as Pikmin saving Marn with the tree's fruit and moments of heartbreak like Duval and Chine in his epilogue. But largely, the relationships in the Blackwick group felt like those of co-workers, those that spent months relying on each other in such a strange, deadly, beautiful land like saint -Fiel, but co-workers nonetheless. How did it feel to go through a season like this, and was it intentional? What was the thought process? And, and as a follow-up, what was it like having relationships with NPCs that were arguably warmer? S with Dyer, Marn with Bucho, Duval with Jolien, Virtue with Darling, Pikmin with Alakest, Chine with It. And then LP adds, what uh, do you think contributed to less inter-party interactions this season as compared to previous seasons? I might be wrong, but despite the chemistry being as rich as ever, I remember several opportunities for the party to communicate amongst themselves where folks seemed to let the moment pass. To what extent was that an intentional characterization of the group? I just want we... to call out this first question for not mentioning um, Likes Little Fish. Oh, Tombo. Oh, no. <laughs> like with Tombo. Be underused. That's because, that's because that was not a warm relationship. That was a uh, rival. Yeah, Tombo was a little shit. Yeah. Like was a little shit. Tombo is a hero. <laughs> that was Tombo said that. Oh, anyway, <laughs> I was just gonna say, um, this came up, uh, Austin, when we were talking the other night, and um, you pointed out that like the structure of downtime was very, very different this season because it was in big groups, and um, you know, as a player, it just often felt like because we were all together, we were all trying to to you know get our shit done yeah and sometimes it would like roll immediately into some kind of story thing it just kind of felt 
Um, I know for me, whenever I had the impulse to be like, oh, I want to have a little moment with this character, it felt like it felt more selfish than it usually mm. does. Like it felt mm. it felt more like, a, you know, I, I think I remember like early on, I did some like throwaway line about S accidentally taking Virtue's umbrella yeah. and have a parasol and having to swap them out and like apologize. And it was like, I, I think back on that now, I was like, yeah, I really wanted more of those interactions, but it felt like there just wasn't enough room for them because our schedules are so weird and we only have a certain amount of time and we all have to get together and get this thing done and then we can move on with the, with the, with the real, quote unquote, real part of the season. Like, so it kind of just felt like compared to when you have a group of four players and you're mm -hmm. doing that downtime and you can be like, well, I want to get this and this done, but also why don't we go shopping? Why don't we do this? Why don't we, you know? Well, um, we, we also needed those downtimes yes. to like keep ourselves from, you know, yes, dying. falling apart. Yeah. Sometimes uh -huh. literally, yeah. yeah. Also, <laughs> those exactly. weren't scenes the way they are in uh, Forge in the Dark games. You have to do upkeep in Forge in the Dark game downtime too, but it's by saying, I'm going to use this, this move. I'm going to do my yeah. repair move and I can invite another character to do it with me, and then we can frame a scene around that. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is very transactional in nature in most cases. Find right? the doctor, pay the doctor. Pay the doctor, right? And we still did those sequences, but they weren't very rarely character, inner party character relationships, right? It was like, do you also need to go to the doctor? Yes. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, but I mean, I feel like that became interesting too because instead of being like, oh, well, I really want to talk to S about something, so I'm going to invite her to the doctor. It was like, well, I guess I'm going to this cave with a like. Hey, like, what's up with yeah. you? And like, it ended <laughs> up being like that experience with like is what sort of, you know, textured Marn's um, interactions with him, even though that like wasn't intentional. It wasn't like, oh, Marn and like have to go do this together. So I think like in terms of like interpersonality, it was definitely less intentional, but like we were able to stumble into it in a weird way. Like, look at how Duval, um, Pikmin likes relationship changes just because it was the three players who wanted to play cards, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, there were other tensions happening in those relationships, but like the fact that they were all like, oh, let's go talk to, um, I would oh, say hasn't. though, the riverboat is like the closest we got to in, in feeling for me at least to traditional downtime for us because yeah. it was very much like we were captive on that boat. It was, look, <laughs> we have these days to fill. What do you want to do? Um, you, yeah. yeah, you can, you can go see the doctor and whatever, but also you're here for these days. Um, more or less. I mean, again, that some things changed there. And again, it was like the thing of like the story, sometimes the story happens and you're done. Um, but that felt, so it, it makes sense to me that a lot of the like, real like um juicy character moments we got were on that boat right i think also when i think about um bits of the show where we've had really strong relationships with the characters i'm, I'm thinking about the the chime um something that keeps coming up with the chime is like um they each sort of we are able to see their personal space and what they like to spend time doing when they're not uh doing the work that the chime does, you know, Mako likes uh, his hoverboard, Ari is a musician, Audi is a weird robot who likes flying a ship. Um, and I don't <laughs> think it was a surprise that on the, on the riverboat, uh, where we all had our own little cabins and we were able to describe, yeah. you know, Pikmin goes into Man's cabin and finds that she's opened up like a bunch of watches or things. And S has the great bender in, in her cabin. And we all go out and have breakfast. And I think that like, the... Like Pikmin Kramer's into Marnes. <laughs> <laughs> Pikmin Kramer's into everybody's room in that arc, I think. I can't remember why now, but I feel like she had a strong feeling about it at the time. To tell everybody um, people got people off the boat, left, even though yeah. they shouldn't have gotten oh. off the boat. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> oh, oh, yeah, okay, about. fair enough. I mean, um, that whole boat was made for this reason, right? Like, I, we, Sapodilla was a very heavy set of arcs that uh, by the time I was I prepping... By the time I was prepping for Jade Moon, I thought it could go even darker because who knows if you get China out, there's stuff under that castle that I prepped that no one saw um, that was dark, dark. Uh, um, and we already, and we did see some dark, dark stuff. So like, uh, uh, you know, I didn't know what the vibe would be like. And I knew that we had not had any, we had not had great amount of time for PC interaction. I was just like, we just need one big cut loose. We just need one big, you know, space where no one has to worry about shit. They can just hang out on a boat, 
and and do scenes and and mm. it's going to be annoying because it means getting eight people together on the call for three or four recordings um but we did it you know so uh sorry jack you were in the middle of saying something i jumped in no i think it's also worth coming back to the fact that um personally i feel that systems like bonds really do help encourage this stuff it is you know we have worked together for a long time and we all know each other very well but these kinds of character relationships are still tricky to just conjure out of thin air at the beginning of a season when Mm -hmm. we know as much about well we know very slightly more about each other's characters as the listener does but not much more um and having a system of bonds uh where we can be like here are beyond just like here's what we did before we got to blackwick but where, where it's like oh i rely on this character for x or i fear this about that character just it is such a useful little tool especially early in a season to start locking in these character interactions and character relationships that can get more nuanced and detailed as the season goes on yeah totally i think there's also like uh one of the big um avenues for pc interaction is like everyone as a group reacting to an npc that they're having like a conversation with um and i feel like song fiel even though this did happen obviously we there was plenty of uh, npcs that we were that were explaining stuff to us and we were reacting to them and reacting with each other um but it felt like there was a lot less of that especially in the first half of the uh, maybe more like the middle half of the um, the season where it's like like there's a lot of combat and yep. there's a lot of like going to places and there's a lot of like asking uh, Austin questions about what's going on but there wasn't uh, you know you've got you've got Bucho who is always like sort of an ever-present part of the season for the for the last half Um uh, but it, it felt like uh, you know there wasn't a ton of um, like the se- like the skeletons. I feel like that kind of NPC. There were fewer of them than usual. Where it's like, here's some NPCs, have fun with them, um, and that's I think probably maybe for me the 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 space where my characters get to know other characters more than any other. Like you know. Uh, um, Bonds are and and uh, what's the other word for bonds? I think Jack just used it. You thinking of beliefs, beliefs, um, bonds, beliefs? No. It's all the different ways that other mm. games do it. Like those are great, um, uh, but for me, I feel like the most that I get to know other characters is by like talking to a weird NPC for twenty five minutes. Right. right. <laughs> um, sure. And there was just not a lot of that in Sunfield. We got uh, uh, um, Alakast turning down Pikmin and the whole group being like, hey. Yeah, that was so good. (laughs) No need to be rude, Alakast. People wondering in the chat about what else is underneath the the Sapodilla stuff. I don't mind talking about this a little bit because we're not going to go back there probably. But like, there's the other half of the the Davia Pledge Ziziliana Esterhazy story, which is like, yeah, the the fucking Glimaki that came and got Ziziliana, and then what did they do? And the answer is, they figured out the shit that they were trying to do with, or they tried to figure out the shit that they ended up doing right. with Heratrixes. Because Ziziliana was a Heratrix. So, like, Ziziliana is the first test subject for what ends up being the thing that S ends up putting a stop to. Um, and there was, like, 100%, the remains of Ziziliana Esterhazy are underneath that castle. And, like, that was a potential interaction that you could have had if you'd gone a different way. Um, and I was like prepared for that to be just like truly fucked up and terrifying and brutal in in the horror story way, um, uh, especially because you wouldn't have any of the context for it. You would have this like monstrous figure that you didn't play the other half of the game, right? So this is like a real uh, I- irony uh, horror. You know, the, the listener would understand that the monster you were confronting is in fact a person who was done badly by um, and transformed into a monstrous shape by uh by the authoritarians who run this place uh, and then and then cast aside um and so uh really really like it would it could have gotten dark dark so i was like we gotta have jade moon we gotta have a, a card game tournament you know um ready to go uh and and we did thankfully and you thankfully also found your way into the 
underground rolling party and second city <laughs> underneath that place instead was great. of instead of I going down the up. other. Yeah, that part that part was great. Yeah. Um so next question. We get to keep moving. Um, do we have any more thoughts real on quick, this? Yes. Uh this the, the being distanced from the other PCs was like very intentional with sure. virtue. And then I was trying to like really hardly ingratiate hazard in a very transparent way with the with stuff where they were trying to kind of glad hand with people whenever they were around them and be their pal be their pal yeah be the so, pal uh, who also cuts people's heads off sometimes yeah mm -hmm. normal who doesn't need a friend like that who doesn't yeah. great anyway love it all right um we've been talking about heart on and off a little bit let's talk a little more d directly um sylvie can you read these from daniel and morgan yeah what do you think went most smoothly about running slash playing heart what support do you feel it provided for the type of play you were trying to get at the table? Where did it cause friction? Same goes for prepping, running the game, of course. Uh, and then the second part, having just finished a campaign in Heart, what advice do you have for players and GMs from playing the game, particularly in relation to beats and mapping the game onto an original setting? Is there anything particular that is good to do with beats you've enjoyed? Anything to avoid? My number one piece of advice for players uh, because we got there eventually. I think for GMs too, actually for every, anybody who's running this game or playing this game is like, you don't have to be coy about beats. You can straight up say, can I, can this be the place I kick someone off the top of something? Or, um, uh, hey, don't you have that beat that says you can kick someone off the top of this? Maybe now's a good time to do it. Like you don't, um, you don't need to stumble into that stuff organically. That's not the purpose of it. It is as, it's like almost video gamey, right? Like you should feel good about clicking yes on the objective and then selecting it and then going and doing it. And, and everyone involved should be there for what the cutscene looks like, so to speak. Not that you shouldn't have to like work for it if it's something difficult or have there be interesting dynamic challenges that, you know, allow for storytelling, but you don't need to, they're not things that you need to feel like you don't get if you didn't work hard to earn them. You know, um, that's my biggest piece of advice. Speaking of video gamey, pick stuff up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pick shit up. Oh, my God. I did not pick nearly enough shit up. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm. And it encar picking stuff up is great because, as Keith demonstrated, you can make use of it. But I also just loved the amount of texture that it gave to the world of, um, you know, here is what is found in this place. Here are little tiny, you know, we're getting to see the world through the little, like, fallout clutter uh -huh. objects that are in it. Um, I really appreciated that. Any other tips or thoughts about what worked and what didn't? I, you know, I will say, and maybe this is the place to say it, that like, I don't know that we had a great time running it for as long as we did. Yeah. Um, I think by the end yeah. of it, a lot of us were burned out on the system. It's a system that I think does a lot of neat things, but it's a system that I don't, I probably had stronger feelings about this a few weeks ago when we were still, or a few months ago now, when we were still deep in it. But for me, one of the hardest things is, as a GM, Fallout, because, I, okay, my favorite thing that we did this season in terms of a consequence, the, the most, ooh, let me break it, let me break a thing, quote-unquote Austin Walker, uh, was uh, <laughs> when you decided to go all in on confronting Alloway, Keith, when Like was like, I'm going to try to steal this heart, and we ended up stumbling into, oh, Alloway is going to get to keep the heart and is going to steal a Terrica call from you and is going to become a Terrica call's new patron slash partner or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that did not come from a fallout. That came from when you fail, I get to make a move as hard as I want, which is not how this game is written. This game is written that there is, there is when you fail a role or when you get a mixed success, you take stress and that stress represents things starting to break bad. Uh, things starting to turn against you, the, the way the camera and the score in the film would suggest that things are getting more dire, uh, but the situation hasn't changed. Maybe you're in a gunfight, so to speak, and, you know, it's you, like, you know, crunched up against cover and the bullets are, are hitting the, the, you know, the, the cover around you and breaking it, but you haven't been hit yet and you haven't, you, the, the kind of core situation hasn't, hasn't changed. And then Fallout is when that, that suggested boiling pressure turns into something serious. Uh, it turns into something that does permanently shift the situation in a way that needs you need to then work against to recover from. Um, and I found that the momentum 
would get killed. Partly maybe this is me not knowing intuitively all of the Fallout available the way maybe, you know, more experienced GMs of the system would after a campaign or two. Um, I, it felt bad every time I gave someone Hex Eye, every time I gave someone Bloody, every time I gave somebody any preconceived Fallout. Um, uh, and it always felt less interesting than what my impulse was, which was, oh, what if this thing happened? And then I would always go, oh, but is that a minor or a major? Am I hitting too hard here? Because this only requires a minor fallout, and the idea I had feels like a major fallout. Or, this is supposed to be a major fallout, but the idea I had feels more like a minor fallout. Well, maybe I can do that, and then a different minor fallout, because two minor fallouts equal a major fallout. And then maybe, did it, and at that point, it's like, my momentum is killed, and I feel like I'm getting lost in the, the texture of, of rules instead of coming up with an interesting consequence and rolling with it. That said... I have a ton of experience playing in games when a failure is I get to make a move as hard as I want. I have, uh, I've learned through practice an intuitive sense of that, and I fully understand why the list of fallouts, all of which are cool as hell, would appeal uh, as, as great prompts for what happens when a, when a roll goes wrong. But I really struggled around Fallout, and I think it's pretty obvious. Like I know, Ali, you make, made sure that like if I was looking for a Fallout for 15 or 20 seconds, it probably didn't go on for that long. But yeah, I think even in the episodes as they stand, it's pretty clear that like this was a stumbling block for me every time. Yeah. Uh, I also think that it was hard. It's uh, hard's too strong, maybe, but... But mapping the game onto an original setting as someone who only did yeah. a little bit of that work mm -hmm. was difficult. And I saw the difficulty that you had with it in other Man. spaces that mm -hmm. like heart is is very much its thing and is wrapped up in its own thing. And as people who, who don't like to play in other people's sandboxes in that way, it it does feel challenging um what advice do you have to do it don't be um weird about that let like uh -huh. we do this right that's the thing like i feel like it's my brain that's weird about this but like i think there's a there's a moment this season where i describe katonia in as evocative a way as i can in the marrow creek arc you know swinging through the 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 woods around the, the town and uh, i describe her flesh and i do all the angel flesh stuff and i do all the like the where where the machines end where the you know the metal ends and the flesh begins and i try to deliver it in this really you know powerful voice in the way that i do when it's time to do a thing like that uh and i like it doesn't it didn't do anything for me because it's not mine like i was pulling so heavily from just what are angels in heart and like this is extremely my own brain and art. I know your brain is like this too, because we've been making stuff together for 20 plus for 20, for 19 years now. We've been playing tabletop games together for 19 years now. Right. Or is it more than that? No, that's, that's right. Right. 2003. No, 19 is right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know your, your brain is like this too. I like my bad ideas. I like our bad ideas. I'm going to in, not like, not like value or not like think they're more quality or better. This is not me saying my, my worst idea is better than other people's best ideas. I like my two out of 10 idea more than I like someone else's eight out of 10 idea, because the thing I like is the process of coming up with it. Uh, and so throughout this whole season, there are so many moments where it's, we're using heart world building and it does nothing for me as a storyteller because it's not ours because it doesn't feel like ours um and so yeah my advice is don't have our brains <laughs> in that way uh art i don't I'm know if you actually have a different direction brains. for that but because i think playing the game in the, the setting rules it's a great setting it's a really yeah. fun it has incredible stuff mm -hmm. and then we take we take some time to talk about how good the angel descriptions are in the book and like they're great. I I was doing they a read bad two different ones too. Right, and yeah, we read two different ones. There are five across the various uh, source books. Um, I think all the stuff in in uh, Icar Drowned, which we talked about um, from from Brendan and Cillian, also has a lot of really great evocative stuff. It's not ours, and so like that to me was a real struggle all season. Um, that is, like we were talking at the beginning of the, the episode about how many great moments there were. And I really do like those moments, but in the process, I, I would leave sessions of this, of running this like cold, like ice cold. Like I just checked, like clocked out from when I used to work retail. Um, because I felt like going through the motions a lot of the time because it, because so much of the game, including fallouts were not ours in that way. And again, I think it's a me thing, not a game thing, you know, it might be a little easier if you're not doing it, in an outward facing way. Yeah, totally. A hundred percent for sure. If you were like, if we were just playing this, mm. hanging out, 
with it not being recorded, it might not feel. You might be able to 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 push past it a little. Almost certainly, right? I'm not going to say no to that, but I also think about like the stuff that we did in college where there was no recording on anything, and I was mm-hmm. still this person about a lot of this stuff, right? Where I was still like, you know not big on module books or source books with mm-hmm. rare exception. And that rare exception is the, uh, the, what's the economic guide to Rokugan called? What's the secret collab? Yeah, it is, it's, it's the merchant's guide, the yeah. merchant's guide to, to Rokugan, which is set up as if it's a, a long treatise on, um, the, the economies of the L five R setting. And then like four or five pages in, it becomes, uh, that it's secretly about the, anti-deist anti-emperor peasant uh uh, rebellion secret spy organization the kalat uh it's a very good source book uh but that's about it that's that's about what i like (laughs) in terms of source books um any other heart feelings sorry i really you can tell i i found the way to pop the top off of the champagne bottle that was my feelings about this game just now, but I don't want to step on other people who also have feelings about what works and what doesn't. Cause I do think there's a lot of good stuff here. Or also if you didn't have a good time, I'd like to hear that too. I know Sylvie, we were talking about what, what game we wanted to do <laughs> next season and wow, I'm being called out. Well, I'm not being, I don't want to call you out, but I do think it's, no, a, no, it's yeah. worth saying that like when we're thinking about what, what else could we play in this setting, you know, not another game using resistance is, is one of the things that we yeah. kind of decided on collectively. I graded against it at times. Um, just like, it's just like an adjustment for me, finding the way I like to play tabletop games specifically for the mm-hmm. show too. Um, I think like a lot of the stuff with the lack of like built in downtime and beliefs and stuff like yeah. really that's helped with me not like being kind of cool on things. Um, yeah, I don't know. It just it, it was a system that I both felt like there was a lot of stuff that I wasn't quite getting I wasn't quite digging deep enough into and at mm-hmm. the same time just like wasn't was also like restrictive in the way that I was like thinking about it. Um Yeah, I don't know. I just constantly felt like weird about rolling. I guess mm-hmm. is kind of what ended up happening at a certain point and I was like, "Oh, that's not We've had that conversation Great before around like the balance of success and failure. I'm curious if people felt like I think the worst of it was when we first switched to Scarlet Villainy, and it often felt like, oh my god, if I roll, I'm invent, I'm inviting big consequences, and so a number of people did not want to roll dice when we first switched over in Twilight Mirage. And I'm curious if if people felt like that at all with Heart, or if they felt like they were pretty safe, or where where that balance fell. Um, as a character that knew how to heal and also had a move <laughs> that could just heal people, and yeah. also I was constantly picking stuff up, uh, I almost <sighs> never felt the sort of dread that I heard from other people in terms of like getting and dealing with um, consequences to actions, personally. Mm-hmm. But I had like a lot of stuff working in my favor. And in your pockets. And in my pockets. Picking yeah. stuff up is a is just an all time tip. And again, you don't need to be coy about it. Um, so many times, someone would be like, "Oh, is there something here for me to pick up?" And the answer is like, "Yeah, probably. There's probably at least a D four resource here that we can find. You know, maybe you have to roll for it, but I bet you can find sometimes, something. And sometimes it's weird tar. Yeah, that's the real <laughs> stuff. That's the good stuff. I think it's it's tough, right? Where it's like. I like this feeling of weird dread, uh, weird mechanical dread, uh, where you know you're you're constantly getting debuffed, and the debuffs are scaling and are making it harder for you to do the thing that you've built the character to do. Mm-hmm. In a game like Darkest Dungeon, um, a where, real when touchstone you're, for us, by the way, this season for sure, massive touchstone. Yeah, when you're playing Darkest Dungeon and you get to the point where you, um, so Darkest Dungeon is a, a roguelike game that is spectacularly, monstrously bleak mechanically. Um, and I guess narratively. Um, and you'll be playing that video game and you'll be at a point where it's like, okay, I think all is lost. Um, I can't do the thing that I am trying to do and I have to take these really big swings and sometimes it will pay off and that will feel incredible. But a lot of the time I will just, you know, um, grind this character into the ground uh, and they'll fall apart. Um, but in a tabletop game where we're making it for the show, sometimes it felt frustrating to be like, I, I really want, to see this character kind of humming along mm. and doing the thing that they're able to do. 
And maybe it's that the... I think this comes back to like, I don't know that we are playing this to kill our characters. Maybe there is a version of this where we do go through 14 player characters, like you <laughs> said, mm-hmm. where we do play up the fallouts as just, you know, miserable and ongoing and horrible. Uh, we're like, well, that's that character done with. But I don't think that was the game that we were playing. And mm-hmm. as such, sometimes when I got a fallout that was just like, it's going to make it really hard for you to use whatever protection. I was like, oh God. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> right, it just like comes across as annoying. Yeah, more than frightening. Jack, do you want to know what was in the treasure room you didn't go to in Parker <laughs> City Beneath? The one that, the one that I went absolutely <laughs> hyper-focused on? Yeah, that one. Yeah, what was in that? All right, there's the floor three treasure room. Spice box, D6 haven. Jewel- I'll take that. Jewelry and gems, D8 haven. <laughs> okay, have you got a, a weapon or something for me? Uh, at this point, you would have probably confronted somebody who had a gilded shot cannon or a prey hook, or or yeah, there were two fucking there super cops up there, up there yeah. just chilling. Uh-huh. Uh, we doing two minute reports on our game now, like uh-huh. <laughs> confiscated sorcerer's contraband D10 occult satchel uh, with the dangerous tag, and then D12 uh, a really nice wooden chair, furniture awkward. So oh my god, it would have been just a really beautiful chair. Thing. It would have been great if we brought that chair down to Chine as a well done on being rescued snack. Chine, we brought, <laughs> Chine, we brought you a really well made chair to eat. That would have been Haven too, because that was not a, a uh, desolate chair. That was not a broken up chair. Uh, other here's the other one. This is the other one that that this is. Here's the punch. Here's the thing I set up earlier. Uh, is if you had if you had fought and beaten this uh, other this creature, this this half submerged failed experiment. Uh, you would have found uh, a closely clutched pendant inside a tiny micro portrait of a beautiful young composer. D6 Haven. Oh. Uh huh. Wow. Let me get that shit in now, though, before the season's totally over. <laughs> um, what would I? What? What? That was Haven. That would have been Haven. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I couldn't have fed it into my armor. No. And I wouldn't have no. Wanted to. Oh my god. But you wouldn't have known. You'd be like, ah, eh, the little locket with a little composer in it. Weird. You know. <laughs> Uh, With a composer, a visible composer. Yeah. Well, that, is that holding probably an been instrument? A conductor is probably what it would have been more of, right? With a so, baton, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we would have found the locket and then music would have come from the uh, other side of the town. Right, yeah, like, totally. Now, wait a minute. Absolutely. <laughs> Hold <Yes>. on. Yeah. <laughs> Did we do this by picking by this up? Picking up this, yeah. <laughs> Real big, uh, like, uh, this is a treasure chest that makes meat or meat <laughs> carpets. Yes, the carpet. Yes, 100%. Uh, you have to go listen to previous friends of the table material to understand what that's referencing um all right and keep on moving here uh ali you want to read this one from gabriel um sure gabriel writes my question is for everyone if you had to play if you had to play as one npc for just an episode which character would you have chosen Tombo. Mm. wow oh, carry me around please away. <laughs> oh, I think I would also answer Tombo. <laughs> hey, do you we know you could just you could play you could play a character who needs to be carried around. I've thought about this so many times. Mm-hmm. Since doing Audi, I've thought about what about a character that is just a weird shape that has difficulty? Like, what if this character is just a, like a chest of drawers or a piece of furniture or something? Or a fish of Audi. like a cube or something. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, I can't make that work. I, I, if there's a way to make that work, I haven't I'm figured it out yet. Mm-hmm. I know. It's Well, that's the thing about being a chest of drawers or a weird piece of paper, or a fish, is it's on everyone else to make it work. You don't have to do shit. Uh-huh. This is why I don't want to do it. <laughs> Ten, the chest of drawers is actually the opposite of being Audi, right? Audi is a robot that moves people around. Right. They're a driver. <laughs> yeah. And it's, yeah. And a chest of drawers is something that, like, it's Gets closer to there? being the ship. Right. They, yeah. the, the, quest, the, trust, the chest of drawers actually carries other things around, you know? Right, yeah. Generally, the first pitch for Audi, which I think kind of ended up in Thisbe in a lot of interesting ways, is I remember sending Austin a gif of a robot whose whole job was planting small seedlings mm. in an orchard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was basically just like an I arm of 500 gif. tiny plants. Yeah. Um, but no, humanoid robot that walks around because ultimately you've got to make the show. Mm-hmm. I mean, this has been um, a long running thing for you, though, too, right? It's like listening back to. Um, uh, you know, as we as we get ready to go back to Palisade, I go back through some previous um, 
uh, divine cycle stuff. And there's some stuff early on in Counterweight where you're like really interested in uh, liberty and discovery being a bunch of little drones that get that fly around and explore the galaxy. And then, and then of course, also T shows curiosity up. shows up, and it's it's like it's like a more developed version of your interest in that that you have more control over because curiosity was was your divine to divine or to to uh, describe. So uh, interesting stuff. Not to get off track, my answer would be Bucho or Alakest, just because I would want to play somebody who was warm and generous and pleasant. <laughs> uh, yes. Counterpoint, pre-Blackwick Alloway. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Ooh, mm. Alloway would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Too late. You did yours. He's mine. No, yeah, you can take Alloway. <laughs> uh, post, yeah. post, uh, uh, PC virtue. Oh sure, oh, wow. Queen of Sapodia virtue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's oh. a fun one. My answer's still combo. I'm just still pitching. Sure, 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 sure. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm gonna play uh, all three of the minors, a la like <laughs> the Lost collectors. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. I'm yeah. I'm claiming large. Large okay. is my answer. <laughs> the tall collectors are so good. I don't love the tall collectors. That was my favorite. What my was favorite the, bit. What was the group? What were the egg people that had like replicas of themselves over and over again? Yeah, that's the tall collectors. The tall the miners, collectors. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that Wait, was also the egg be my people. Were they egg people? What did, did weren't they like the people who like first found the egg? Oh, in they they stole that. They stole nah, that egg, or they they <laughs> did they? It to Alloy, yeah, right? they brought it to Alloy. They stole it and brought it to Alloy. Who then? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Correct. They did not come from an egg, though. They were not. They so were not. Keith will play one collection of them, and I'll play a different collection. Of them. Uh -huh. it'll, it'll be. And fun. then I'll, and I'll, I'll play lots. Lurch. You'll get all of them. Yeah. <laughs> no, wait. I'm getting Lurch, who is the third one. Who's like, I'm not Lurch. My name is Lurch. My name is Lurch. <laughs> Yes. Oh, that's really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to be the lady who runs the "You Will Never Come Back" game at the circus. Oh, oh my god, oh, yes. I forgot this about that. Disappear forever. You disappear forever. You will disappear forever. Yeah. Oh, oh she would be someone that was Zephyr's never Zephyr's on Zephyr's screen. Oh yeah, of course. I yeah. think. Please. Uh, I will be the skeleton queen. Oh, oh Alta Pasqua. Yeah, yeah. Alta Pasqua. I key. can't I'm fucking believe we didn't end up going. Yeah, you down are. in true. the murky depths. We truly were going life. to. We were truly going to. That was going to happen, and then it did. We, we almost going to go down we, there. We talked ourselves out of it. One second, to do I, something. Oh right. What do we? What do we not do instead of that? Well, is it? Where is this coming up? We'll Where's the question? Yeah. <laughs> where, where the fuck is the ending question? I don't know what number it is. We'll get there. We'll oh, get wow. there. Oh wow! Interestingly, we'll there. where the fuck is the ending? It was sort <laughs> of uh... <laughs> yes, yes. Um, should we keep moving? Any other yeah. NPC? I feel like we got sure. good ones there. We should we should keep it going. Uh, so I looked at how many questions are uh, left. Huh? Sylvie, so, can you read this one from Vivian? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Sanfiel was my first season following Friends at the Table, as well as supporting the Patreon to look behind the scenes. And as the season went on, the structure of the narrative appeared to expand and shifted to something beyond what was originally expected. I can't help but feel like the truth of the Heartland derailed Oof. the original vision of the series. What elements of the season did you expect to be larger than they were? And what elements emerged in ways that surprised you? Great question. Uh, we got a bunch uh -huh. of other questions similar to this around, like, moving away from episodic structure to bigger plot f focused stuff in the back half and leaving Blackwick dis despite starting with ground itself. Yeah. Yeah. My one kind of is just a, a, a result of like virtue leaving the season halfway yeah, through, sure. um, which was the, like both the stuff with what's going on with like darling and like mm -hmm. what is keeping virtue alive and like the residuum and like, there were like ideas for like the death god and shit and like that's stuff I can message you about when we come back to the settings. For but sure. um it was just like stuff that never really ended up coming up because it just didn't end up getting the time to develop. But like I'm fine with it. She's a fucking machine god now. <laughs> huh, true enough. Other stuff that, that maybe people thought would come up or wanted to come up more that didn't. Um well in a weird way I feel like the the second half was a lot stronger than the first half, uh, even though I also feel like I wish we had done mm -hmm. more episodic stuff. So I'm like, I wish that we had stuck with the stuff that we were doing in the half that I think is the worst half. Yeah. I don't really know what that means. <laughs> uh, no, I get it. I do. I, I, so my original plan was to do more stuff like Roseroot Hall, 
um, where it would be like very close by to Blackwick, uh, or even in Blackwick itself, and using delve yeah. mechanics to represent things that were not delves, like hauntings. And then the way the speed with which Roseroot Hall was <laughs> dealt with was like, oh, I this isn't I I don't know that I could have ever said you only get to tick two steps on this delve because you rolled because you got a success but then had to roll damage on the haunting like you found where the thing was and i the abstraction there didn't work for non-traversal things for me um I, there's an example in the playtest document for heart where they do a sort of ritual via a delve and i think we maybe did one or two things like that where we use delves to be something other than traversal but it never worked as well as go a place heart is really really good at go to a place and have some wild encounters on the way, explore a space and like get from point A to point B while dealing with weird nuns showing up with the leg of a dragon or dealing with a weird hippo monster in a cave. Um, and that stuff is, uh, uh, I think ended up pushing us away from the episode or not the episodic, but the, the Blackwick cent centric stuff that like we wanted to do. I wanted to do a game about a place and then we picked a game that was about leaving a place behind even even getting back could be really hard um and then we did the thing of like oh these two stories feel like they're going towards sapodia let's do a sapodia story and then that ended up being a huge chunk of it um and the way heart works is like there are specific mechanics for travel back and forth from a place it is not a game where you are supposed to just snap your fingers and then say getting back is easy uh, that's a thing you earn by doing certain things to make the tra the trip back more easy. And even then, you don't get to just come back for free. It's just like the difficulty is much, much, much more reduced. Um, and I feel like we probably have the thing here of the John Harper runs Blades in the Dark and runs a score in Blades in 40 minutes and it takes us four hours. Where like, I bet you could run a Delve in 40 minutes. I bet you could get to and from Sapodia in 40 minutes. Not the way we run the fucking game. Everything we do is a scene. Everything we do is a conversation. Everything we do is an encounter. I don't even know how it works. I should just listen to, to one of those and even see. It's what just it very abstract, like. right? It's just not as <laughs> zoomed in on making everything a it's, capital M moment, you know? I, yeah, I just can't even, I can't picture it. Like, I can't imagine. <laughs> you, I it, thought you were saying like. you should listen to our show. <laughs> no, no, I've heard that one. Yeah, I really got to listen to one it's of okay. those. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also think that the other half of this is that, like, for me, I like Roseroot Hall. I like bits of the very first arc. Um, uh, but I think Bell Metal Station is where it started to really click for me. And that was, of course, the moment building off of stuff from Yellow, from Yellowfield, from the Candle Factory, where I started working in the meta plot about bad utopias, about the rights of the Seventh Sun, about Zevenzolia, about the Steve Lights, all that stuff. And like, I truly think you're getting a better version of me as a GM because my attention and interest tick up when I'm saying something and like when I'm trying to build towards something, even if I don't know what I'm building towards because I am the rights of the seventh son, I guess uh, like there is the act of building is more fun to me than the act of facilitating you through my prep. Do you know what I mean? Um, that's not as it's not going anywhere. Uh, and so I think I just get better as a GM and as a writer if I know I'm pushing towards something. Um, and also, I think we all did just get more comfortable around then with heart in terms of making it move, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Any other feelings on stuff that the, that y'all thought we would get to? Or feelings about the episodic structure at the beginning, the sort of like, yeah, this is just like, these are all just loose stories. Uh, I, I regret not knowing more about Blackwick by the end. Yeah, me too. But also, like, knowing more is also a funny thing, because it's like, there isn't more to know, because we just didn't invent more, you know? Right, yes, yes. I regret there not ha being more to know. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how, like, Blackwick was supposed to be sort of the location. Yep. But then Sabadia ended up being such, like, a memorable place where, like, character arts were changing, and, like, these big, these big, like, world structures were involved in there. Uh -huh. And, like, when we went to Sapodia, that didn't really feel like a big player choice. No, like, it's it just where Kaylin fled to, right? And then 
Right. Well, I think initially it was pitched like, oh, who wants to go to Sapodilla to right. help art find a, a painting? That is it. And yeah. the, <laughs> the Yellowfield people went to Yellowfield and then it was like, oh, the train from Yellowfield is going to go to Sapodilla and we're going to have this like really interesting structure in terms of whole party is going to be there. Mm-hmm. That's when we did the interrogations, obviously. Um, nope. But it, it feels like that's when we sort of left Blackwick behind, mm-hmm. question mark. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, not that I regret it. It's just No, no, see. I think you're totally just, right. It's funny because that is like the second arc. What is? <laughs> like um, yeah. Bell Metal. Uh, Bell, Bell Metal and Yellowfield. And Yellowfield are the second. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We got Rosewood Hall. We got, we got, uh, we got, so we got Ground Itself, obviously Curse of Eastern Folly. Then we got Him and the Mother Beast, Rosewood Hall. I'd say, I'd say Rosewood Hall is a Blackwick story. Him and the Mother Beast is because because bla- it's about the it's about the chapel of the mother beast but it, yeah. it visually is not inside of blackwick but it is about the history thereof so i guess that counts the nuns yeah. end up coming back through you know we can see them with their cool flower faces and stuff we get I a, consider those both to be uh, blackwicky uh, black stories black, yeah uh we get a downtime we get market day in blackwick that's blackwick candle factory not blackwick what happened at Bell Little Station? Not Blackwick, except the very beginning when you're on your way to the neighboring town. That to me feels Blackwicky, but the bulk of it, not Blackwick. Gates of Sapodilla, no. Whispers by the City of the Sea, no. Perpetual Oratorio, no. Hark, no. Uh, Passage on the Jade Moon, no. Clap Cast the Most Wanted Song, yes. Uh, <laughs> Sophia Helm, um, uh, Marrow in the Field, Marrow in the Bone, yeah, no, but I would not trade that arc for the world. Um, just returns forward, yes, right? Or I guess two cuts of quarry, no, but just returns was, and then you know wax what? and icker. Maybe and we were. did deserve to be fired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we did deserve to be fired, but not by then. Not right. Yeah, not by then. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. That's um, it. Yes. I quite liked Blackwick just being like the place where, through bad luck and circumstance, we bring back all our demons. Yeah. Um, and I think that that worked really well by, we spent so long setting up Blackwick. Um, and, and so the ground itself did a weird thing when we played it, where we rolled to see how long the gap between, um, sort of events would be. And we rolled the smallest number we could. And so we produced this like hyper dense, really weird opening where Mm -hmm. everything happens in this city over a period of like one horrible week. Which I suppose presages us returning and bringing back, you know, the wax and the mm-hmm. the pale magistrates. Um, but it meant that we got to know it really intimately at the start, and then we left it, and then we got to see everything fall apart there. And I I, I liked that a lot. It was yeah, it I, felt it felt cruel to Blackwick in a yeah. way that I think was <laughs> consistent with us making a horror season and consistent with you know what we know about the Heartland, which is. You know, in prep, we talked about trains regularly destroying towns, mm-hmm. and we talked about you know the course or the shape or the structure sweeping through and and changing places irreparably. I mean, you were describing earlier, Austin, a situation where a landmark falls through the ground mm-hmm. into somewhere else. So I think it's very in character that we make this place, leave it, and then come back to smash it to pieces at the end. Yeah, none of my none of my regrets and uh, you know would they should theys are mm-hmm. about like or, like translate actually to wishing we did something different right or like not right. liking what we ended up doing it's one of those things where it's like we were making saint fiel the show not blackwick the show right i think if we decided after doing that intro like we actually we really want to stay at blackwick the two things we would need to do is rename the season blackwick or choose blackwick as the name or choose eastern Which folly we thought as the about name. doing totally and i think we stopped doing because i think it was you correctly said we're not making a blackwick season <laughs> and we weren't we were making a song fiel season and not play heart play a game that has community building Mm -hmm. in it in a deeper way there's there again there are mechanics often about like building roads to and from a a haven in in heart uh if you read the sanctum uh book it's like something 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 sanctum or or something like that uh that has uh uh, some more rules about trying to run a haven based game but it's still basically go out from the haven and come back to it uh the difference being the traditional heart game you go out from what for us was Conchentis for for Heart's default setting is Derelictus towards the center of the heart, and you have business along the way. And we did do the game where you leave the Haven and come back to it. It's just we didn't come back multiple times, you know. Um, so, um, all right, I'm gonna keep moving. Uh, 
Sorry, was there a, did someone have something else there? Oh, no, sorry. Unrelated. Unrelated. All right, Keith, can you read this? Sure. Um, this is the Stella Jude. Correct. Um, sure. Uh, Jack, in previous postmortems, you have firmly established yourself as not a violinist. However, this season's soundtrack makes extensive use of violins. What was it about Sanfiel's sound that made you want to use violins? Um, I... I think I've talked about this before, but I thought we were going to be making a different season than the season yeah. we ended up making. Uh, so when I was doing pre-production for the music, I was still imagining uh, the city, the vampire city. Mm. Um, and I thought we were making something much closer to Bloodborne um, in terms of it's we're going to be in a city that was a sort of noble or... Um, upper class space that has fallen to ruin and destruction and so all my we early bring the brinkwood notes, game basically if we if we had decided to play oh, brinkwood right. the yes. blood of tyrants 100%. one of the games we have since talked about is like oh could we do this and we do something out with this that is not a hint about what we're doing i will talk i will no. give you the list of games we've talked about doing later <laughs> Um, and so I was looking at um, harps and I was looking at Baroque music uh, because I wanted to make something that was so distinct from Hieron going back mm -hmm. to fantasy. So I really, you know, I ruled out um, an acoustic guitar and I tried to rule out a clarinet as early as possible. Um, and so when we had this first prep meeting and everyone was like, yeah, we're making a, <laughs> we're making a Western, there was a real moment where I went, oh, oh God, none of my prep works at all. So I started looking for inspirations for music that felt um, sort of shattered or ruined. Um, and I found the great um, Michael Nyman soundtrack yeah. for the uh, film Ravenous, uh, which is a uneven but fun film about cannibals. Um, uneven uh, but fun? Yeah, uneven but fun <laughs> film about cannibals. <laughs> uh, and it has uh, an incredible uh, soundtrack by Michael Nyman in which he, I can't tell whether he... Uh, got people who couldn't play the violin or he instructed professional violinists to play as though they couldn't play the violin. Um, and it produced this, like, just this remarkable sound. The violin is an instrument that has so many affordances for you to make sounds with it that aren't good, um, as anybody who has ever heard a child play the violin can tell you. Um, and I heard uh, um, Michael Nyman's soundtrack for this and I was like, oh, this is, this is where I can go. I need to find an instrument that I can't play, um, but I have enough passing familiarity with to be able to make sounds with it. So I thought about the trumpet, um, which is not something that I can even begin to, you know, I come from yeah. playing the clarinet, which has 60 or 70 keys and the trumpet has three. Um, so that was off the table. But being a guitarist, I, I looked at the violin and I thought, I broadly understand how a fingerboard works. And there is a lot of room here for me to make sounds that are broken or are off kilter um and so my goal was take uh try and compose uh as as like quote unquote well as i could or like try and compose properly and then try and render it out through an instrument that i can't really play um to make the sound of uh, a, a place that that once was uh able to produce music "Quote unquote properly," which is not mm. really something I believe in, um, and has since found that they that the the tools and the instruments available to them don't work. Do you feel like um, you got better at the violin despite actively playing poorly? Yeah, I, I did, uh, but not much. Um, okay. There were points towards the end of the season, and I feel this towards the end of every season, where I was running out of ideas, and with the goal in Sangfiel being to make the music feel. Um, perverse and strange and off kilter i was sitting down and composing and feeling comfortable with the instrument in a way that i really wasn't happy with where i was like i need i need this to be weirder and stranger um and so that's what, the last track was um uh, pikmin goes home i was trying to do something that is really difficult for someone like me who can't play the violin which is overdub these things very closely get this rhythm feeling as precise as i could uh and setting myself up to fail so to try and produce this this sangfiel sound again but all the instrumentation i even on instruments i know how to play i tried to fuck up in some way um i would detune the clarinet i would play the clarinet facing away from the microphone um, I would mic the piano in a really weird way in the few times that a, a piano showed up. Um, I would sit in front of the microphone and perform vocal parts with my um, knees kind of crunched up to my chest so that my um, diaphragm was um, 
out. I try and pick keys which were just just uncomfortably outside of my vocal range. Um, it was really a project about trying to compose as best as I could, but but push it out through instrumentation uh, that I wasn't familiar with. <laughs> and it turned out great, IMO. So mm -hmm. thank you. I'm so stoked for when we get back to Sangfiel. It's I've been thinking about this a lot as we go back to Palisade, where it's like a, a sequel to a sci-fi show, but mm -hmm. there's going to need to be a a, a breadth of change mm -hmm. in the music going from um, Partisan to Palisade. And Austin and I have got some really fun ideas about what that is. Um, but Hyron, kind of the, the soundtracks for those are drawing from the same palette. And I think yeah. Sangfiel is Sangfiel probably going to draw from the same the same palette. So when we come back to Sangfiel, I'm, I'm so excited to pick up the strings again and start making horrible noises. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. You should uh -huh. get you should get a different instrument that you can't play. You should get like a I'm dulcimer. I'm thinking about or it. I am thinking about it. I can play the dulcimer. Um, ah, damn it. it might be the it might <laughs> be the trumpet. Oh, what I want to get is a bass clarinet. I had to do Ooh. so much. Um, so there's no digital right. instruments in Sangfiel at all, except for a bass drum because I I you know you live in upstairs right. flat yeah. uh -huh. and I don't own a bass drum. Um, but there was a lot of, and I'm I'm really wary about you know sort of getting on my high horse and saying all the instrumentation was analog or organic because it, it truly wasn't. There was so much digital and computer processing that went into this right. soundtrack that is uh, visible uh, in an interesting way or just completely invisible. You know, pitches were changed, things uh, pitches were bent up and down, um, rhythms were messed around with. There was so much processing on on basically everything. Um, but the big one was, you know, um, dropping everything down an octave to to create bass versions of the instruments that right. I have. And so when we go back to Sangfiel 2, I would love to get a bass clarinet, um, which is just a huge, deep clarinet, <laughs> um, and mess around with that sound. Truly, if you're the hammer dulcimer it. or the mountain dulcimer, or both. <laughs> I can play a hammer dulcimer, but I would need to look at a mountain dulcimer. A mountain I was thinking dulcimer. mountain dulcimer because that's like the American dulcimer. It's much yeah, different. It would be fun when you it? live here now, so you have to switch over. That's yeah. the law. I know, I know. That is the law. Yeah. Did you if know it's the violin? three keys that bothers you about the trumpet, I think you can get one with a fourth. There's a. I think you can get a trumpet with a pinky trigger. Sorry. For, I mean, a clarinet has sixty keys. One extra one is not going to make me feel more comfortable. Uh, it's a it's a thirty three percent increase. I think you're really not <laughs> giving it enough. Uh... Mm. Trombone. That's a that's a tough one. No keys on yeah. that one, right? I can't yeah. play the trombone. No, <laughs> that might be fun. Trombone also is a is a is. I find them I mean, infinite very keys. compelling, but also inherently kind of funny. Oh, something that might be worth saying is um, Austin and I have talked about this a lot. There are no guitars, no acoustic guitars in Sangfiel, not just in the soundtrack. But there are narratively, they yeah, they, they don't wow. truly exist. world building wise, they don't exist. Um, but uh, Sangfiel, much like they've invented trains in a weird way, um, they have found an electric guitar in the mines. <laughs> this is something that Austin and I have talked uh, about, and it's something that I sketched. Uh, the oh shape trains theme was an electric guitar, right, and right. the. Um, Pale Magistrates have a big, like, Wild West uh, Morricone sort of electric guitar riff associated yeah, with them. Yeah, That just never got put in the show, and we yeah. can talk about that. Okay. Oh, well, this is, this is, that's one of my ones for things you wish you'd gotten in the show, but you didn't. I mean, I did. I just had to do it in the very last possible second in the one place oh, the that radio. I have fiat. Yeah, is, is the intro, is the radio. In my mind, from the middle of the season forward, one of the last images of this show was going to be people in Blackwick pulling out a massive radio antenna and built like bit by bit one of the last things they get out of the mines is the, the kind of big metal cross beams and and you know wiring of this radio antenna and they're puzzled by it and scratch their heads and then figure out how to put it together we know radios exist because marin had that cursed one oh, um, yeah that tries to talk uh, to the moon it talks to talk to the moon and then like i I was just talking about this, but a, a book that I don't know that I'd recommend. I haven't read it recently enough to know if I could recommend it. I would. I would. I certainly remember it being rough in places, as much of Philip K. Dick's oeuvre is. But Doctor Blood Money, um, uh, or How We Got Along After the Bomb, uh, has a an incredible conceit, which I'm certain I've I've drawn on it before in Friends of the Table. Maybe not have referenced um, in that in that movie, which is like a post-apocalyptic, post you know Cold War. Uh, book. Um, there is a uh, a family. The first family of Mars is launching on their way to Mars. Uh, a guy named Walter or Walton. Uh, Walt. Uh, fuck. What is his last name? It's not Buzzfeld. It's um, 
God, I forget. I forget what his what his name is. It's some. It's Walt something. Um, uh, he and his wife are on their way to the to Mars to go colonize Mars, and you know it's like the sort of person who's on the front of a Life magazine cover, right? Uh, Walter Dangerfield, that's his name. Um, and he's you know in a satellite waiting for the final rocket to fire to go take him and his his family to Mars, and the nukes drop. And he his, he gets that he never goes to Mars. He stays in orbit forever, and becomes a radio like a, a he his he can send messages down. He can send radio signal down as he orbits around the world. And so everybody around the world knows that like at seven p.m. Uh oh. Uh-oh. Speaking of radio signals, is this me? What is this? What's that? That's Jack, I think. Jack, are you good? Yeah, Uh-oh. that's Jack. We've lost Jack to the satellite across the world. Um. Hopefully they're okay. Anyway, Jack says they'll fix it. Uh, Walt ends up being like the voice, you know, in the heavens calling down the one radio signal everyone around the world gets at like 7 p.m. their time uh, as as he floats around the world and he reads books to them and he, uh, you know, plays what few records he has up there um, and that he gets to be this kind of important unifying voice. And in my mind drawing on that was something i really wanted as a final image for blackwick and we kind of snuck it in there as the um the editor of the uh the heartland writer ends up becoming a radio dj instead of being a, an so editor. much fun um which you know industrial industrial pivots in technology and media are are a backstory happening throughout sanfiel's with the rise of the pledge cylinder and all that stuff right so yeah Anyway. Um, real quick before we move on, someone in the chat asked, how do I hold the violin? Um, Great I question. It, um, uh, in my left hand, like you hold a violin, uh, but against my chest instead of at my um, at my um, chin, um, because I wanted to be able to see how my fingers were working. Um, and the, the thing that they tell you, especially when you're playing the clarinet and playing the piano, is don't look at your fingers because you will screw your sound up completely. Uh-huh. And I was like, sounds good to me. Let's, <laughs> let's go. Um, next question. Uh, Art, have you read one? Who hasn't read one? I have, I have not, not read, read one. one. Right, oh. I'm... Art, do this one. Jack, you do the next one. All right. Uh, next one is many of the characters seem to exemplify not just background or history, but a foundational truth. Is Mabel coming through? Yeah. No, oh, is she Mabel's a good allowed. Time? Okay. Um, Exemplify not just background or history, but a foundational truth of the world. I'm thinking of China with the course, Pikmin with the shape, and Duval with the structure. How would your prep and world building differ in this season relative to some of your earlier seasons? Were the players more directly involved in creating the details of some of these major background elements? Are there any lessons you've learned here that you're planning to apply to future work? I would say no more than some past some past seasons. Um maybe more in that basically every character touched some big part of the world in that way in terms of the nature of vampires the nature of shape knights the uh, but you know try the mirage opens with y'all creating what end up being the eight major subsections of civilization you know and even my <laughs> variations yeah. down on choir are just knock-ons from your main your your work there um is there anything especially different here? I think it was very key. I think that, that having those three things of the course, the shape, and the structure was very interesting. Seeing those come together independently across your three prep stories. For people who don't know, we did uh, interviews, interviews. We did conversations about prep, prepping these characters from a very early on perspective. Um, all on the Patreon. I think those are all drawing maps. Uh, definitely worth going back and listening to those. Very interesting, I would say, uh, about based on where we ended up with all of them. Um, did y'all feel like more or less invested in the world creation stuff than normal? I'm curious. It's, I, uh, I, only I wouldn't my say less invested, but I felt like Involved, I did I mean. less. Yeah? I mean, you did less yeah. than the Equiax, certainly. The Equiax are such a big yeah. deal. But, but I feel like we have Equiax tier stuff here, like Shape Knights and the structure it just wasn't yeah. you weren't in the My driving thing, seat this I, time right you and dre were trying to figure the name for the course i named you the did course. name that the was course. my one you did thing. name the course. <laughs> yes this is true this is true i think something that that definitely struck me 
as different was that we were making a fantasy season outside of Higher On for the first time. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll approach this in another question, but right. uh, even setting aside Higher On, the idea of being like, how can we go to a fantasy space mm -hmm. that is new and how can we make that feel new? And also after having made Higher On for so long, what are we excited about that we haven't been able to put in our sci-fi seasons that would fit in a fantasy season? Mm -hmm. um, and how can we get that involved? I was so excited about um, uh, the creation and the dread consequences of industrialization uh -huh. um, in a fantasy world. And it was so exciting to be able to have a space to explore that kind of stuff. So that right from the jump, I was like, oh man, yeah, we've got to have people like chopping down trees and people digging for, my first notes for this season were like people digging for oil mm -hmm. all over. Um, yeah, There Will Be Blood of... was definitely one of our touchstones. Y'all yeah. right? did a pusher tier uh, podcast on mm -hmm. that. Um, but yeah, so I think the, the world building prep uh, in the, in its difference for me was like, we're making somewhere completely new. What are we excited? About? What does that give us to be excited about? Mm -hmm. We also had way less. I, I we already hit this on the COVID question, but like, I cannot communicate how much less time I had to prep this than I like to, um, and sit with yeah. it. Um, there, you know, uh, there are people out there. I think it, it, the Beam Saber Discord, where where uh, I still post every now and then, where like, we are deep in in conversations about various, you know, uh, various books I want to read and books I am currently reading about indigeneity and revolution and you know we're, we're out there talking about the metis and talking about Franz fanon talking about you know what does a uh, what, you know what what does anarchism say about um about decolonialism and so and all that's like prep for uh for palisade um uh and like i have a big reading list that i'm working through for that i did not have to, I, we did not have time to do a big reading list for this and i mean that both in terms of deep philosophy and theory and po political work. Um, but I also mean that in terms of uh, genre work, um, the the lead time between Partisan and, and Saint Fiel was not long enough for me to do the sort of world building I like to do. Um, uh, it was not long enough for me to feel like I got into the right space outside of stuff I could watch in the background while doing other work. Um, uh, you know, I was also gearing up to quit one job and start another one and a one that would be very busy uh, during this. And we made the season while I was getting used to working a new job and new hours and all of that too. Um, uh, so I think that there is a, a degree of that that I think really shifted there. And I did, I did really rely on being able to come into this with, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Like that was, that was supposed to be very freeing for me. And in some ways it really was to straight up say, yeah, I don't know what the big picture ideas are here yet. I don't know what the, I have like a big thesis, but I've not done the preliminary work that I normally have the time to do before we have to keep doing this so we can all make our rent. Um, we don't, you know, I, I can't take six months off the show to go like do a sabbatical to prep for this show. We have to keep making the show. Um, and, uh, that I think I was very grateful to be able to rely on y'all coming up with big ideas like, uh, the, the shape, the structure and the course, uh, you know, collaborating with me on that, but also things like the Tolorisist union, Heratrix's, like, uh, you know, all of that stuff ended up being big, 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 big helps, you know, the, the cleavers end up being, and like, what is a cleaver ends up being where some of our most important stakes end up hinging at, at the end of the season. Right. Um, and even even when I wasn't relying on it in that way, stuff like the centrality of um, uh, a Terrica call, which is like, yeah, I came up with a Terrica call, but like I came up with a Terrica call to be a one-off monster you kill, right? This this uh, indifferent god that the early you know colonizers of this place ended up taking, you know, convincing to to work for them instead of for locals. Which, if ever there was a recurring theme in in Friends of the Table, it's that. The world will not. The world is not on the side of justice. The the nature does not have a, a a dog in the fight, except for it's going to kill us all in the end because of what we're doing. But it is not a. I don't believe that nature is is anti colonial, right? Um, unfortunately, uh, I don't believe that that's a truth about the world. Um, and in fact, it ends up being a thing that that imperialists use to to 
gained more power is their exploitation of it, their willing exploitation of it. Uh, and so there is a uh, a recurring thing. So like something like the Rosewood Hall and uh, a Terror Hall story is dealing with that. And it's supposed to deal with that and move on, right? It's supposed to deal with that and then the Terror Call disappears. But instead, the Terror Call ends up being the other big, you know, major, you know, ongoing uh, a threat throughout this season. Threat and and character. And maybe it wouldn't have been a threat if some things go differently. Threat? Um, you think threat? Yeah, I think so. I think maybe yeah. a th- threat. Let's say, let's say neutral threat. Um, uh, yeah, the residuum in chat people mentioning, also huge, for sure. Um, so, yeah. So, like, I think that there's a lot of stuff there that is, like... Um, there's there is stuff where like the prep me not having time to have the prep really you know made me grateful that i could leverage y'all for coming up with some of these big de- details yeah. and we worked hard on it like go listen to those conversations like i was absolutely giving y'all homework and being like you know <laughs> come back with more detail because i needed it to be able to do this season um i knew i was not going to be in a place this year where i could pick up the slack because i didn't have the time to do that so uh, hopefully, hopefully, getting back to Palisade will be a little bit. You know, we've we we still have some months before we get back to it. Uh, I'll say now, don't don't expect you're going to hear a trailer for anything at the end of this. <laughs> this uh, we do not work on those time scales imagine? anymore. We just don't. Uh oh. Oh. Uh oh. It's fine. We're fine. Don't worry about it. We're okay. okay. It's all. It's fine. <laughs> Um, well, part of the reason there's not a trailer for it is the, I mean, part of it is that that we haven't recorded like a ton in the last few whatevers. Yeah. Um, and so we just don't have it. But also part of it is like doing the road to seasons means like having, being less sure about like there's stuff that we're we're building up what would even be in the trailer yeah by playing I, you six, know going through six different sessions of, by the time we got but we got we got to that trailer for the road to even though pretty quick coming off of hyron uh it's it, it's COVID. like COVID truly fucked our our scheduling up it made so much of the work that we used to do or that i used to do as both for in terms of prep but then also patreon maintenance and stuff like that so much harder for me to do because like i have to do it from a space that i struggled deeply working from um yeah. and it's i have not found a solution to this yet so um anyway uh, uh, improv a trailer at the end of the stream yeah uh-huh. <laughs> no, we won't we won't we'll not. i'm Don't sorry no we'll 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 joking about that even uh jack you want to read this one yeah, Sasha asks, as we saw, Sungfiel focused on a few antagonists who were each interested in their own terrible version of Utopia. What was the inspiration for that? Were you all interested in exploring that theme from the start of the series, or did that emerge during play? Mostly emerge during play, with the exception that, and Jack, you kind of pointed this out, right, in the comment to this, which was that like one of our big questions was, what do people do in the face of not understanding something and the answer is that they they begin to hypothesize answers and and believe answers of their own um and try to find schema to put on the world and i think it, the extension of hey here's how i make sense of the world too and therefore the world should be like this is is one that yeah. we are always interested in um but then i think it just it came together between the Kaylin story and the alloway story i was like oh here's what's happening and the and the mother beast story to some degree though the um the sisters of the mother beast making their own little hymn to live in forever is also a sort of weird utopia right i think um, also just from a structural perspective when we're te- when we're telling a story where anything could happen one way to sort of uh uh anchor our way through the structure of a season is to say, here's what this character thinks could happen. All right, now here's what this character thinks could happen. Mm-hmm. Um, they're sort of like weird little resting points where, you know, in the, in the sort of the noise and churn of Songfiel, we're able to go, all right, Alloway's vision of this looks like this, or the Wright's vision of this looks like this, um, before we go plunging back into, you know, how Songfiel is right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's 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 pretty much it, right? I don't think we need to stay on this one too long um, because, again, it wasn't like a, there was no grand motive outside of, oh, this is a fun thread to start pulling on, and then next thing you know, you have a deck of cards for a weird cult. Uh, um, a weird cult slash secret society. That was the other thing with the rights was very much thinking about a lot of the eras in history we're talking about end up also intersecting with interesting secret societies and occultism and and stuff like that and the rights very much are drawing on that stuff so is the 
you know, the answer to this can be like, I don't know, let's figure it out. But uh, is the deck of cards itself a reflection of that in terms of the like weird um, sort of uh, tchotchkes that secret yeah, societies definitely. have? Yeah, definitely, 100%. Oh, it's the ring or mm-hmm. it's the little wax mm-hmm. seal. And in this case, they've all got like a little custom deck of cards. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. I'll read these from Vaughn and Kate. Vaughn writes, Thank you all for the hard work you put into making an incredible show. I noticed in this season that there was significantly more tension between character desires, particularly like and other PCs, that seemed in audio to result in some frustration between players. How do you deal with this uh, deeply emotional, these deeply emotional character conflicts in a way that maintains healthy relationships between the players? And then Kate writes in saying, I always appreciate the out-of-character discussion and debate about PC conflict. Hearing how a story is created is one of the things I really appreciate about the show. And it's also reassuring to see that the conflict doesn't extend beyond the characters. Opposite reads on the same audio. This is, mm-hmm. this is what it is to listen to things and, and perceive. <laughs> uh, my question is about balancing that kind of discussion with the RP itself or transitioning from one, the RP, to the other, the conversation around the, the character motivations. Uh, does it ever feel difficult to shift gears or to potentially reiterate what was just said? This came to mind when listening to Chine's final moments, where what the characters actually said out loud was so brief that standing alone, I wasn't sure whether it supported the resulting action. Of course, it wasn't standing alone, so the story came through, but I'm curious what that experience or other similar is like from a player perspective. Big, big um, question. That's a lot. I don't want to speak for anyone else this year, but I never felt any out of character frustration or, or you know, emotion this this season at all. Everything was yeah. just play and the characters. And if it'd gone a different way, I think I would have felt exactly the same. Mm. I don't know if it's just like appreciating it as more of just like a, a you know if, if the virtue thing had gone the other way i don't think i would have been mad or upset i think it would have mm-hmm. just been what it was you know yeah. and that's not you being precious and being like well we're we we all always we never have tension we have definitely had those moments we've talked about them before many but this times. wasn't one of them yes uh yes. yeah either of these instances being described here i i mean the the chine the chine thing was heavily negotiated before it was recorded i only the well, I only halfway through we had a little, right we we mm. had to i mean we just say it outright right that we recorded a whole sequence there and we it didn't went like differently. it it went differently and we went back and we we didn't like it so we talked about what it would be and the only conf- the only thing that that happened is that when when we went when i went into that recording i thought duval was gonna kill chine Mm-hmm. And that was not what everyone else understood was yeah, going to happen. Yeah, that was a big that was, was a big surprise weird. for me. Yeah, and I um, was like, I was about to be like, well, we sh- we should just let that happen too, because I also wasn't like gunning for Chine even a little. Like I wasn't like, hey Austin, if we go back to this, make sure that I'm the one that kills Chine. Like <laughs> that didn't happen at all. <laughs> well, well, I I remember telling Austin that I thought that like should do it but if if you keith weren't comfortable with it that i would right and us never circled back to me to say that, oh yeah that keith and i do talked it. through it yeah so let me just yeah, slow down so and talk through this whole like, thing. all right yeah. let me yeah. give like the, the the high level and also right, dre should talk about this because i think china is dre's character and is i'd love to I, hear yeah, that, that's, that's who played china yeah. yeah yeah um <laughs> yeah, you're right. uh so that whole sequence happens the first time through and it ends in this sort of all right, uh, uh, I keep pushing for ways to de-escalate it as if it were a real conflict between people who I care about deeply. I start introducing roles that players need to make in order to make things happen. I start introducing you know, a role will happen and it's like, all right, this is still going to fucking happen. Someone's going to die. And I keep introducing new reasons to try to convince chine to back down or or like to back down i keep trying to find the thing that will let this de-escalate um and it eventually does right i think the thing that ends up eventually happening is uh you end is it china you end up saying or dre you end up saying that chine won't it's not that you won't give it to duval you would have been happy for that to happen but it was something it related correct 
Do you even remember? Uh, it's been four months now, right? I, yeah. I remember. Allie it. remembers. Please, <laughs> please, please, please. Uh, well, what happened is because the, the conversation had come to a point where it ended up being a role where Chine had to convince it. Right, to, to go to. Yes. Right. Yeah, I yeah, say yeah. it will not leave yeah. your side. I tell you it won't do it without a role, which is wrong because it would do it without a role. That's the, it is a thing. It is not my character. It is yours, right? Um, and, and because it felt like that's where you wanted to take the story to go. And I kept trying to put the brakes on it. I kept trying to convince the rule. I kept trying to leverage the rules away from this big character confrontation, despite having spent three hours on this character confrontation, slowly building. Um, and that's what we end up doing. And we end up stepping away from it. And then individually, I talked to everybody. Dre, you weren't feeling good about it. Art, you felt like Duvall should have done so. You felt like Like should have done it, or Duvall should have done it if, if Like didn't. Keith, you and I talked about what that might look like. Uh, right. Dre, you were pretty certain, and this is where I'd love to hear from you, thinking about that ending and like where you were with it. I think one of the things we kept coming back to was like, well, well what's the future look like for Chine? And it seemed just empty. Yeah. Um, can you talk about where you were with Chine by that point in the story? Uh, I know this is like a heavy one or like a difficult one because it's because this season was really hard to make. Yeah, and I not mean, like I a, think... not in a. I don't even mean in like a meaningful, fun. <laughs> and here's the lesson we learned: uh, way just yeah. like in a, it's hard to carry heavy rocks. You know. Yeah. I mean, I think. Gosh. Okay. Part of this goes back to the second or third question, the question from Dahlia about like COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the thing that I have realized about Chine more than anything is because Austin, you and I have talked a lot mm -hmm. throughout the season about how like I was really struggling to play Chine. And there were times where I did not, like, I just did not like playing Chine, um, which was then kind of doubled down in a weird way because I kept seeing a lot of people like really like Chine yep. and really draw cool fan art. And I was like, well, fuck, what is going on with me that I don't like this, this character, but all these other people do. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I think what it all came down to was that um, like right around the time that either we were starting or we were kind of getting into saying Fiel, uh, I quit my job and I started a private practice mm -hmm. Um, and at the, like, I don't want to say the height of the pandemic, but like, um, when we were like, still like actually doing things to address a pandemic, <laughs> um, <laughs> the height of, of, uh, federal interest in the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Federal and state government interested in acting like we're in a pandemic. Um, and I honestly, I think the way that I dealt with being a mental health professional going through a pandemic and helping people who are also going through a pandemic was just checking the fuck out from everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think my, I think that is my biggest regret with China is that I think a lot of times this issues that I had with China were the result of me kind of checking the fuck out from everything. Um, and then having to make like a snap decision. Mm -hmm. um, and so never really feeling like I had a good idea of, how to play Chine or like who Chine was or where to go with Chine. And I think at times that made for like good, interesting moments. I think um, you still from, like, yeah, from my perspective, it's still, f it's wild because so many of the things that you end up embodying in Chine feel coherent and consistent in the sense that like my favorite moment of the season is when Chine meets the doppelganger in Marrow Creek. And it is not a moment of reflection or nostalgia or inquiry. You play Chine in exactly the way you have threatened to play Chine, which is you belittle this person, <laughs> you dismiss this person, you hurt this person, you destroy their home. Um, you have no, you've less than no interest. There's a, there's a degree of, um, uh, not bitterness, uh, but, but um uh, resentment or, or not even resentment it's not as emotional or sentimental as resentment right animosity yeah just yeah just raw animosity um this person's nothing to you and like how dare they get in the way um mm -hmm. uh and i i i when i think about china i think about that initial set of conversations we had about china and the most telling thing that you said and the thing that i think that you did internalize from a 
I don't know if you internalized it or if you just happened to play this way, but it seemed like you internalized this was we were talking about what the difference between you and the Taloricist or Keen like Marn would be. And you said there would be times when, you know, Taloricists are there to help people. That's what they're there to do. We had these big conversations about like, you both feel like you're variations on a witcher in some way. You know, you're, Marn isn't a, uh, isn't a, a monster hunter, but is someone who's about addressing un the unknown and coming to a town and helping people and figuring out what's going on there. Um, uh, but with you, you were saying with Chine, Chine and the Cleavers will often be invited to help a situation and then side with the monster. And say, oh, no, 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 this is what's supposed to be happening. I'm sorry, but the werewolf is supposed to eat the child. That's what the werewolf does. That's, what the, mm -hmm. that's how it's supposed to go. And I think that that has been super consistent with Chine from, from the jump. Um, and and you, know, you see a lot of that in the relationship to Blackwick and, and a lot of that in the relationship to anything except for characters close to Chine. We had this conversation earlier about how like player characters don't have close bonds. And China is the one person who is like constantly like, you know, I put on for my city. It's not my city, my friends, I guess, in this case, like I'm going to get in between anyone who's trying to hurt one of my friends. It doesn't matter how fucked up I am. I'm going to help the people who are I'm close to. Um, I think that is really interesting. And I'm curious if that is that also something that you felt like is just stream of consciousness play and not sitting with the character play. Yeah, I mean, I think so, because like, honestly, um, Keith, I think when you said on the question about like, uh, like world creation and stuff, I think you said like you felt like you weren't as involved. Yeah, um, I that resonated with me because I felt like there was a lot of stuff about cleavers that like you and I brainstormed about Austin that I just I just and we never like came back to. Mm -hmm. um, like, I think the the best like mechanical example I can give would be um, the mechanic or, that I picked up about like the cleaver being able to like tell stories about like right. specific like monsters and stuff yeah. like that. Um, which I think again, like I think we've we've talked about this right where you've expressed regret for like I wish I had given you more of those opportunities. But yeah. honestly, I I think if I were if I hadn't been as, as checked out as I was at times, I would have like pushed for those more and advocated for those more and looked for those more. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've gotten away from even the question you originally asked me. <laughs> no, I think that this has all but, been, this has all been very exploratory in terms of feeling in that moment that, I mean, it's both it's two sides of it. One is you not being particularly heated and tense about that moment, but the other side of it, not necessarily feeling like the way you played the first time through was tied to like a big picture idea of who China was. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that makes sense. Um, to get to the question of like, and we have more China stuff to say in literally a second, we'll zero in on another part of that, that answer or this, this event. Um, but we do, We've gotten very good, I think, uh, or gotten better at having these sorts of moments, making sure everybody is um, it, making sure that we're talking about character relationships and not player relationships or player dis uh, uh, disputes. Right. Um, and importantly, giving giving ourselves space. We do a lot of saying, let's play it out and see how it goes. And if we want to change it, we can change it tomorrow, which is something you can do at your home game. Like, don't ever forget that you can say let's try this and if we don't like it we can come back and change it mm -hmm. um uh and to that end uh to kate's part of the question of like when is it when do you know when to switch between ca in character play and out of character negotiation and discussion is a it's a real what's the table feel talk about that at the table because i know that there's a style of play because i used to play this way you know 19 years ago with art where where starting to meta quote unquote meta game even in the con talking about what a, what is happening inside of a character's head is not a thing I wanted to do at the time. I wanted to always be in character. I wanted to be RPing, right? Like I am making, I am role playing. I'm I am the character I am playing as. I'm going to inhabit it. I'm going to embody it. I'm going to step away and have to like come down from that experience. Um, uh, and that's I lean into that as much as possible when I was in college, and it's how I liked to play. <clears throat> um, but as a GM, I often encouraged 
not just doing that and thinking like a writer, thinking like a writer's room, collaborating, talking, zooming out and talking about things with uh, from narrative meaning, uh, thinking about how systems intersect with with play and encourage certain types of readings or actions, which is a big part of how we ended up doing this too. Like Keith, you and I went back so many times thinking about like, and we didn't decide it through this conversation really. We ended up it ended up still feeling like it was kind of up in the air until we recorded it. But like, is there is there a way for you to get a zenith that you could trigger here that changes things? Yeah. Is there a way for you to do you do you use uh, uh do you try we to use had a tariff really, call? Really do we try to use conversation yes about how to how to do this uh in a way that that felt like like it, it would work on screen you know yeah yeah um Definitely. I, think, I think we got there but, yeah i think so too i think the stuff with the uh, i specifically like the shift the subtle shift in relationship with the beast the ravening beast which is uh, maybe let's talk about fallout i love the ravening beast oh, what a great fallout it. the ravening beast was yeah also this is maybe the the other thing you know when you talk about hating the fallout yeah part of me is like like a part of me, is, it's not just like, oh, I don't really know. I don't see where Austin's coming from here. But it also feels like I haven't seen Austin feel that way <sighs> when we play because I'm always getting the Ravenny Beast and it's always so fun. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like when, when the fallouts are great, they're prompting me to make decisions I wouldn't, I wouldn't come up yeah. with naturally. I just happen to believe that I would like those decisions too. You know what yeah. I mean? I, but I wouldn't yeah. have come up with the Ravening Beast for you, probably. There's no way, right? Um, uh, it's it's such a particular and interesting thing. Though, actually, maybe I would have because you were the one who came up with the Ravening Beast, in a sense, because it comes from I your did, prep. Yes. It yes. comes from your... So, Total well, coincidence that there's a move like that in the thing. But yes, I it, sort right. of simultaneously... Or I, I came up with it, and then there was a direct analog in my character's book that I had literally not seen. Right. And then you didn't get rid of Ravening Call. In the same way, no, never did that. Marn didn't get rid of whatever the the Alloway one was. Um, you know what was so fun was I always had in the back of my head, like I could just get rid of it, like in yeah, in, and not just like I can get rid of this, uh, uh, uh not, not like uh, I know that I can get rid of it, but I won't. But I was like, if I was ever like so flushed that I could just get rid of this then i will and i really felt like that was true and then every time it came up i was always like yeah but i really could use this like d6 for so like i really mm -hmm. don't want to give up this last d6 mm -hmm. and so every time the decision came up i renewed like no i will i will keep this item to not get rid of it <laughs> and so it genuinely didn't ever feel like um like a long term plan like it 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 I almost forced it feeling like an accident that I always kept it yeah. on to myself, which is a ton of fun. Yeah, but I think about the, the fallouts I really liked. Ravening Beast. Uh, Alloway is going to come kick your ass. That's the name of the fallout. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Ma uh, Marrow Creek, the Mirage uh, one. Uh, the one that, like, the next landmark you arrive at is not going to be the thing it seems like it is. Uh, and then Alakast. Alakast being um, infatuated by your your uh, knowledge of Zevenzolia and wanting oh, to yeah. that's also a fault making the wrong person mm. too right yes uh, and so it's interesting because the faults I don't like are things about the moment and the ones that I have had a good time about Ravening Beast is often about the moment because uh, of how the Ravening Beast shows up <laughs> and yeah. then uh, that part's rough it's always so good but, but it's also about like why it's a long like, term right. of this exactly monster. and the stuff that I like it's being that long term stuff the long moon is sort of like that too but when it was like again i keep coming back to like hex eye or you're bloody now or your leg is busted you just can't use echo you can't use echo stuff like all. i don't that's i mean and i would i would play in that space i almost wish that version of the game the version of the game is like those are types of consequences that are um I don't know. Like it's almost as if I, I, when I think about blades in the dark consequences or forge in the dark consequences, and it being like, okay, this is the type of thing that could happen. That you know, a wound is the type of thing that I could give you minus one dice when you're, you know, when you're doing blank because you've taken that damage. That, that's available. Um, or in in you know a, a Power by the Apocalypse game, you could get a minus one to a stat temporarily or whatever. That stuff is all available. Uh, but for whatever reason, needing to look through it every time and find the right one just really bummed me out. So anyway. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one because we're still on shine time. Uh, this is a cut down from a very long email from ARP. 
um, which says, in the final confrontation between Chai and Like and Duval, I couldn't help but read China as having lost control of themselves in a way that looked very similar to a mental health crisis, especially since we already seen them snap out of a similar episode in Marrow Creek. So the jump to lethal force from Like was sort of terrifying. And it's a horror season, so great. Love to be terrified, but don't love to see it and then uh, see it then framed as Chine just being whimsically stubborn, uh, whimsically being stubborn as a person or having weird beliefs, unless they were. I don't know, maybe that's the case. But then uh, the it question earlier in this email, there's a question about it cycles back around. Um, but I don't know if y'all could speak more on, on any of that a uh, little, I'd appreciate it. I know I'm in the minority, but like decision to follow through on executing China after they'd stopped building the dam and offered no resistance. Uh, and the subs, subs uh, to be clear, China would have kept building the dam if like had left. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and the subs, the subsequent <laughs> lack of any consequences for that choice was very disturbing for me. This is, it's so funny because this is like, um, the, the words, uh, trying to have lost control and then jump to lethal force like we there is not a single scene in the whole thing that has more control and more and less jumping than this particular moment mm -hmm. uh out of character right out of character in terms of it being like and again we've had those situations at the table before where it's like oh this is getting heated someone is going to say that their character draws a knife you know um uh, this was so much more negotiated than that and yet, I think, going back to what Kate was saying, the way the sequence plays out, where it's like, so much of that conversation is out of character talking through stuff or talking through getting clarity. Hey, is yeah. China ever going to back down on this? No, then let's not. We don't have to keep going back in a circle. Yeah. We can get this to the stakes, you know? If I can have two more meta comments on this. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is like, um, you know, jumping to lethal force. Uh, I think that there's like another sort of like, you know, hand wave actual play thing here where it was like, we couldn't sit there and do a fight. We just literally couldn't. It yeah. was, we had been doing this for so long and it was eight of us. And like, China and I have already been in a situation where we forced a bunch of people to wait while we did combat. Uh -huh. um, that did happen. And also uh, it's not, <laughs> uh, Dre was, Dre was very clear. I will not fight back. So it wasn't right, going to be yeah. a fight. That was the other thing is that like when you're doing, when you're doing like, a lot of games have specific rules for PC on PC combat. I don't know the rules for this, but like there ha sort of both sides have to agree that there's going to be combat <laughs> mm -hmm. and I can't like turn it into a, like a fight fight. And then the, the other thing I just want to get this on the record because I know people were upset that like kill shine. Um, uh, the thing that I said to you, Austin, when you reached out to us individually to be like, it seems like we're going to redo this. Like what are people's thoughts? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I said, uh, I have no problem morally with like killing Chine. <laughs> if Chine didn't stop, I also wouldn't have stopped. Right. If someone was telling the story after the fact, I would not want to be the guy that let Blackwick be a permanent nightmare circus because his friend really didn't want to stop. Right. And then, you right. know, that doing this. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. I, that was sort of the mode that I was in, which is like, the stakes were really high. Like this wasn't just a situation for me where like my friend was doing something that no one liked and like it's time to ha time to help my friend. Uh, it really was like this is life and death for hundreds of people are on like literally like this is, you know, in a in a in a action movie analog like this is like China setting a bomb like this is the this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that is my. That's how I was going into the situation. I don't know if Dre or uh, or uh, Art have different feelings about how it happened, but Dre or Art, <laughs> I don't know that I do have different feelings. Yeah, similar feelings. Dre, do you have thoughts on, like, Chine being... I mean, I will say from the production side, one of the things I really wanted to emphasize was Chine's vision of the world. I thought a lot about how one of our first big Chine moments was the the teeth, um, looking at the looking into the sort of, like, scrimshaw dream version of the course. Um, and I wanted to make sure that there was something like that in, in the moment of death, because that's what the world was to to chine chine and the cleavers in general have this other perspective that does not come across when you're talking about d12s like um and when you're talking about like 
HP and Fallout, and that's a that and and how many resources do you have in your pocket? That is a junk mage way of seeing the world, right? Um, uh, not not to, that's not me picking on like, but it is picking it is it is me saying that like, in a way, Heart sees the world the way Lilacan sees the world, and I wanted to make sure we included a last vision of how Chine sees the world. And then I actually think Chine showing up in Duval's finale, that whole finale feels like very coursey to me also, you know? Mm. Um, so, but I don't know. Uh, Dre, do you have any other thoughts about like the difference between being stubborn and being like, you know, having an episode quote unquote, as Arp says? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I mean, I could, I could talk for half an hour on what it means <laughs> to have a mental health crisis. Uh huh. Um, but I think like to, to sum it up, it was like, like Chine didn't fit. Yeah. And I like, and I say that not as like a, like a, an awe sad way. Cause I mean, I'm with Keith, right? Like mm -hmm. I Chine shouldn't fit if, if, if Chine trying to fit is going to end up killing or whatevering uh you know getting people stuck in a in a lifelong magic tornado circus <laughs> um that's not good um i mean i think i think you can acknowledge that and still say it is like sad and yeah. tragic right um that's not me saying like so yeah don't be sad uh chine deserved to die um, i was very sad when we recorded it i really felt no, like it, it felt it felt what like what chine was doing was like asking us to kill him yeah and i mean i don't know if it was that far but it was kind of like yeah like i i think but it was you asking us to kill john <laughs> yeah. not necessarily um i mean that was not like i didn't go into this being like i want china to die um like at all but you did go uh, into it with the beat uh what was the exact beat do you remember no, I can destroy see if it's still in the point. Destroy yeah. a haven, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> destroy a haven, yeah, returning yeah. the land to the heart. Yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And you were like, I'm um, going to pursue this. Yeah. And it's tough I don't want to make like a, like a universal rule for people listening to this, but if you have a friend who is trying to trap you in an eternal <laughs> clown tornado... Yeah. That's not a friend. Don't feel like you have to give them too much space there. Like you can assert your own <laughs> boundaries about being in a never ending clown tornado and, and do what you need to do to leave that situation. That situation being again, trapped in a clown tornado that is threatening to envelop you forever. Yeah. If we go back to the COVID question, I think I have an answer that involves the phrase eternal clown tornado. <laughs> yeah, I think um, just to back it up, uh, I think we, if anything, we're not going long enough on these questions. <laughs> yeah. Which makes sense. Um, I do, I, I, I like what Nathaniel just said in the chat, which is that China and like were stuck in the cruelty of Sang Fiel. And mm -hmm. I, I, th I think that is a, a good way to, to look at it. Totally. I mean, this is the like, one of the reasons I liked this moment is because it is Sanfiel in that way, and this is the threat of spreading Sanfiel to the entire world, right? This is the, the trade-off of it's sick when you let the supernatural haunted blood fields uh, spill out into the empire that once colonized it, uh, and then the rest of the world as it breaks through Conchentis, um, is that... Uh, this is the stuff that some of that happens in Sofia, right? Um, Dyer is very ready to let that happen everywhere. Is very ready to let the like Chine confrontation happen across the entire world. Yeah. Um, uh, one of my favorite bits is S being like, "Okay, but can I be there to kind of intercede a little bit?" Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I, I I do think that's sort of some of the the interesting part of that scene as like. We're talking about, like, why were the character dynamics different this uh -huh. season? And, like, why did it feel like people weren't that close? Like, Pikmin had had that conversation with Chine. And so, like, yeah. it felt like some of the characters who would have been more... I mean, I'm speaking... Oh, I love here, this part like, of it. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, if, 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 if you know, if, if S. Pikmin and Marn had not been the people who were like, okay, this is happening, we're going to go deal with something else now. Um, and, like, it is the thing of, like, sending the wrong person in to go talk yeah. to Chine. Because, like, there's, 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 there's ways for that, that 
conversation to happen differently. But like, that's not the scene that we had with like in Duval. And it's Chine um, being the wrong person to talk about what they believe, right? Like, Dyer Ode and Chine believe the same thing <laughs> about the world in a real way. I mean, Chine is not a devotee, or sorry, Dyer Ode is not a devotee of the course. Um, or is only as is only as much as as he is also a devotee of the structure and the shape and what and the blood of Saint Fiel, the people of Saint Fiel and everything that that mixes together. But is a is a defender of the course in that way. Does think the course deserves to exist, um, uh, or or that those that existence shouldn't be uh, stuck where it is inside of these walls. Um, and Diarode could have tried to convince like of that. I mean, Diarode wouldn't have been trying to destroy this particular yeah. town because of a big difference there, you know, but Dyer wanted to go do the thing Dyer had to go do. And to do that, you had to not get eaten by the clown tornado. Um, but I loved that disconnect between it being like and Chine and not two characters who could have better enunciated the particular worldview in question and worked through it. Sorry, Art, you were well, going like is Like or is Keith. pretty coursey. Like is pretty coursey. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Like I actually like think the second most coursey. I think... I think that the two, I think that like and and shine are pretty close on this stuff. Yeah, like like also believes in taking care of monsters. You know, <laughs> you're two people with pet monsters. Truly, yeah. You had two pet monsters. You had three if you count combo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think that, I think that we're stretching the definition of pet uh -huh. or monster, one or the other. Uh, no, Tombo is a monster for sure. Um, no, Tombo's the only three of them that it was a monster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tombo resents that. Uh, yeah, but like that—that that to me is part of the the best part of this conversation. Is like, Chai knows this stuff and uh, knows what they feel about the world, and is a is a killer. That's like the thing that you're good at doing. You didn't have Haven, I don't think, Chai or talk. What's the talk verb in this game? Compel. Compel. Um, would have had Haven if uh, if I, I brought the chair. Back. Chair. The chair. Yeah. yeah true. True, true. Yeah. True. That pleasant chair. Mm -hmm. um, I think something that was. No. Let's let's move on. No. Wait. What? I mean, I suppose real quick, like something that was important for me in playing Pikmin and was like deeply frustrating, but was sort of part and parcel with the character, so I didn't feel too internally bad about, is that Pikmin has a pretty rich uh, internal. Pikmin thinks about Pikmin is not blunt on the inside. I right. think Pikmin is thinking things through and uh, she has ideas about the world and she has ideas about how people in the world should be treated, but she does not have the experience or vocabulary to be able to mm -hmm. output those ideas. Um, I really have, I've never thought of Pikmin as someone who's unemotional or, you know, in that uh, Pikmin, there is more to Pikmin inside but between the horns than there is what comes out of her her mouth right um and something that was just so fun and so frustrating when pikmin goes to speak to chine is was trying to articulate was trying to perform pikmin knowing that this was wrong but not being able to explain why um and i'm so delighted that that um it didn't work pikmin bounced and then they sent in the wrong people right right all right, keep it moving. Uh, how do you, Anonymous writes, how do you decide what moments in the show get a soundtrack? Do you know in the moment or do you figure it out later? Speaking of moments uh, that got soundtracks. Mm. I mean, <laughs> our answer to this is uh, sort of pretty consistent with the seasons that we make, but I want to make a big uh, caveat here, which is that this soundtrack was produced during COVID. And getting the show soundtracked is a real process that um, Ali and Austin and I are kind of all involved with. Um, but it is one that is time consuming and difficult. Okay. So there were scenes in this that I would have liked to have soundtracked, but I also don't uh, wake, I, I don't uh, lose sleep over the fact that we didn't, just because the material conditions of making Song Fiel and making music and making anything during a pandemic are going to make things harder. Um, but he also had a specifically or particularly busy year. I immigrated, mm -hmm. and and immigration was horrible. And it is hard to make music when you are like physically trying to do other things that have time commitments. And it's mm -hmm. also hard to try and think creatively when you're spending all your time thinking about how 
you know, immigration works. Um, but in terms of how we decide, there's sort of three ways, and I think Ali and Austin can help me out here if not. Either we'll hear a scene in a, uh, a in the recording, and we will all agree, okay, this needs music. And sort of straight away, I will put a message in the chat and say, hey, can I get a copy of this scene when it's done? And we talk it over and I send through um, scratch tracks, which mm -hmm. are sort of like um, sketches really, uh, very unpolished uh, sort of uh, attempts at ideas. And I'm so grateful that having done this for so long, Ali and Austin are both uh, pretty confident that no matter how horrible the scratch track I send them is, it will get rendered out into something listenable by the end. Um, the other way we do it is that I won't be in the recording and Ali or Austin will send me something and go, we think this might be good for music um, and we'll talk it through and pick it. Um, and the third way is that uh, I will listen to a scene and go, this needs music and everybody else will go, does it? <laughs> uh, and then... <laughs> And then either it will or it won't. Mostly about, it does. Um, if you if you ID something that does, it tends to yeah. be yes. Also, it tends to mean you have an idea. And I think Ali and I are, it's rare that we're like, don't follow that idea. You know? Sometimes what will happen is I'll write demos for it and it just won't work. This happens maybe more than would you would think listening to the final show. But like, I write a lot of music for the seasons that doesn't get, let me see, how many files are in my scratch track folder for Sangfiel? Will they tell me how many files are in this folder? <laughs> While you're finding that, I, I will say that... Um, 53. Jeez, <laughs> jeez. Uh, normally, in the, ca the rare case that you say, I think we should do a song for here, and Allie and I say, like, mm, mm, maybe not, mm. is really only because we know there is another big song that's <laughs> yes. either just after it or before it, maybe, and we're like, just, just get the one. Just do the one mm -hmm. we know we need. You <sighs> don't have to do this yeah. year of our or this month of our this day what uh, was our this year of this year, this year of, ours. of ours yeah yeah this month of ours is when right. every character had a theme yes, in the end yes. i really only wrote two character themes for this which was lie uh and was um all the stuff surrounding chine i thought that uh, was your way of writing... saying that you were lying just now <laughs> <laughs> which was lie um but you know writing character themes is exhausting and it's really stressful because yeah. i don't want to make uh an assumption about someone's character musically i, mean, I think the role of, of a composer is to mm. kind of like help explore what the rest of the story is telling and, and we don't have like, the rest of the story jack yeah uh -huh. that's part of it I right mean, the rest of the story other than the composer you know i like, get when that I'm, but i'm saying that like if you were to write a lie lichen theme today i bet it would sound a little bit different than it did when you wrote lie six six tracks yeah, into the yeah, theme 100 percent. Right? that's actual play um baby i love the character themes personally <laughs> i i'm i'm happy with them but and it's i'm glad to hear that but i do always feel when it's like oh god now i've got to write a theme for duval or something it's like is the thing i think i am communicating about duval different from what mm -hmm. art thinks he's communicating about duval uh, even pikmin goes home is not a pikmin theme i thought about doing a pikmin theme but yeah i mean pikmin's in such a weird place at the end of this like, i don't know what a pikmin theme even sounds like yet you that know? that is music about finding yourself back in something yes and yes. going here we are God. um it's a fun ending fun sometimes ending we cut music we we write a bunch of it and then it just absolutely doesn't work. That's um, very rare. Don't tell people that because they're going to think that we threw out a bunch of songs, Jack. <laughs> yeah, no. That has not happened. When has that happened? Uh, when I start composing a thing and go, I'm going to try and write music for this scene, and then it just doesn't happen because yeah, I can't come up with an idea same. good enough. That's not the same. Yeah, we don't thing. cut throwing, finished. finished. We don't <laughs> cut finished. I just want to no, give we people don't. the wrong people feeling. People are going to be clamoring for the uncut soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we don't cut everything except that full length scoring of all of Mary Elda. That right. 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 To do <laughs> yeah. Mix, mixed, and then yeah. threw oh away. Uh, I think it's on physical hard drives buried in the desert. I yeah. Think, Which desert? <laughs> You'll have to find out. Yeah. Try all of them. Mm -hmm. Remember uh, that Antarctica <laughs> is also a desert. It's true. <laughs> The uh, something I did for uh, for Sanfiel in part because I knew nothing about the world or the characters in it. Once I had to shift focus, was I started writing themes for fictitious places and scenes. Oh, true. Um, and sending them to Austin. My early notes are called. Um, my first note is called "This season's going to kill me," 
Uh, and then I have Blood in the Vine, which ends up becoming all to do with the um, the, uh, the Hymn of the Mother Beast. And then Plaguelands Riverboat, which I wrote before we did. Uh, that was before we even started the show, but ends up being kind of um, the Jade Moon. And then yeah. Fire Sprites demo. Uh, oh, and you liked right. Fire Sprites enough, Austin, that when I sent it to you, you said... I'm going to have to set something on fire in the next arc. Just to We didn't do that, this. though, did we? <laughs> but we didn't. No. Damn, save that. We'll come back to it. Set something on fire next season. Yeah. Um, uh, so keep, everyone keep your eyes out for a fire. Uh-huh. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> it's out there. I'm going to move on. Yeah, uh, uh, Janine, can you read this from Colin? Yeah. Uh, hey, friends. I have a question about the way GM prep worked for Austin and Hart, both within individual session slash arcs and bigger picture, and how it interacted with player decisions and fallout. Did you prep fronts that built up over time, transforming through PC intervention and neglect? Uh, was it more session by session? For example, in the Just Returns arc, did you have fronts or some similar threat clock type situation? for the Magistratum and the Wax Vampire going on in the background while the Blackwick company were off doing something else. And this is where those countdowns were at when they got back to Blackwick. Or when you sat down to prep those sessions, did you have a looser sense of these are the threats that are in play that make sense to have come to a head here? How much of the Wax Vampire stuff came out of Marn's fallout in the moment during the session versus what you'd prepped? I, so for people who don't know, fronts was a term from, uh, fronts is really a term from Apocalypse uh, World that then gets used also by Dungeon World, which we ran Hyron in. Um, uh, and then things like Threat Clocks, you might remember from us playing various Forge in the Dark games or the Sprawl, where there were kind of corporation clocks. Uh, these are all tools that we've used in the past, that I've used in the past as a GM to keep track of big picture threats. Uh, other factions and organizations looking to pursue things, you know, Beam Saber that we use for Partisan has an entire faction system that does a great job of tracking other, uh, you know, other factions pursuing their ends, you know, and counterweight on top of the corporate clocks. We also did the Stars Without Number and Microscope game uh, with Sylvie and Dre. Uh, that had big factional and narrative uh, implications. Uh, Heart doesn't have any of it. Heart says stop planning stop it stop doing planning uh you know build and break tension I mean, you hear me say this stuff right you hear me read read my interpretation of their of their goals at the beginning of every episode and it's it's build and break tension you know uh, ask stop don't plan ask questions or something like that um uh evoke a, an atmosphere of wonder horror and humanity or something like that um uh build and break tension uh, and so like that is like that is it. Their heart is not a game about factions. Uh, we specifically picked one that wasn't about factions um, for the reason we talked about before in terms of uh, trying to do an episodic season. Like, you know, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If all, if all you give me is clocks and faction rules, I'm going to tell a story about factional inter, uh, inter, uh, interaction and involvement. Um, this is not that story, right? Yes, there are some big organizations in it, uh, Yes, the rights of the Seventh Son are sort of working towards something. I wasn't ever, ever, ever keeping track of how close they were to doing a thing because that's not what heart is. Um, and I'm not going to try to. I'm pro hacking games, and I, in a descriptivist sense, believe that basically everybody plays hacked RPGs. That there are always house rules, large and small, that people make. I don't think that's a problem with them. I think that's a feature. Um, I, I think games like Apocalypse World lean into that feature and give you the tool sets you need to improvise new rules on the spot. Um, uh, uh, and so all that's good. But I don't like to take a game and make it my thing. Um, uh, and I instead would prefer to find the thing to, to play that version of the, of the game, right? Like if I wanted this to be a season where I did have fronts and factions uh, and threat clocks, I would have decided we should have played something else. Uh, and instead, I wanted to really lean in, really give the style of play a shot. Um, what ended up happening is around Bell Metal Station, we get the rights. It becomes clear that people are kind of interested in that, or at least sort of interested in Kalen. I think about the big Zevenzolia model reveal as being a potentially fun follow-on to that. That stuff feels like, okay, this could become a long-term plot uh, that we come back to in future seasons. So let me give that some airspace. Um, uh, Alloway comes back because Marn has the I'm going to come kick your ass fallout. If Marn gets rid of that, it doesn't happen, right? And that's not me putting that on Allie. That I'm grateful that Allie didn't get rid of it because 
it it was a weird one to feel like how you would get rid of it would be to I don't know how you would have gotten rid of that na- narratively. Yeah. Mechanically, you would have spent a resource at the right thing. <laughs> you know, we would have had to come up with something. Um, right. That's why I never touched it because I was like, I'm not just going to give someone like a, a weird fork and then this guy isn't going to be mad at me anymore. Exactly. Like, that's not. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so there is a real. Um, there is a real desire on my part not to try to invent mechanics for stuff like that. Uh, Fallout represents a lot of that stuff. Uh, uh, that stuff is there, um, and so um, I felt like doing a mission about, and also, and also, narrative stakes do right. Like there are consequences for things. It was very it, the stakes of that first, that very first adventure were, hey, if you kill this guy, people are going to come looking for him, and they did, you know, um, and so no, didn't didn't really manage uh, anything. The, the only way to think about it is that any time a, a big Fallout hits. That could be about one of the pieces on the board that you have. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my short answer there. Otherwise, I prepped a lot like I do with Blades in terms of, uh, especially for something like Just Returns, where I have a pretty good understanding of what the Just Returns and the final arc. The um, What is the actual name of that arc? Uh, is it um, Dead in the Dust? Dead, and, and also Waxicker and Iron. Those final few, I had a pretty good idea of... Um, what's going on in Blackwick, where the threats are. And so I, I, my Blades prep style, which is like build Hitman levels in my mind and on paper, um, ends up being pretty useful for, for that. So, so here's a place. Here's where the people kind of are. Move those around if you need to to make the story make sense. Um, don't worry about it so much, you know? Uh, so there you go. Um, uh, Drake, can you read this from Hazel? Yeah. Hello, I'm very interested in how you handled Sylvie's shift from playing Virtue into playing Hazard. It was a very bold move that worked out incredibly well, and I'd love to hear more about what drove that decision and how you handled changing major characters mid-season from both a narrative and organizational standpoint. Um, the way, I mean, the way it, it happened was that it fell into our laps, um specifically like i don't think this wasn't one of the ones that we like planned ahead of time i think when it happened we were just like happy with it we didn't go back and record anything extra Uh, did we do pickups for that i don't remember doing pickups i want to say keith and i maybe did a pickup on the beach or something i don't maybe we didn't i don't remember doing any big pickups for that yeah uh yeah the only thing that might have gotten picked up was like where i woke up yes this was over i can't remember if we ever did anything uh, maybe but I we remember talked you... about it and then didn't end up doing it. I don't remember. Yeah, I think we we definitely talked about it. We yeah. can agree on that yeah. we talked about yeah. it. Um. Anyway. Um. Yeah. And so, like, it it the like shift to hazard kind of came uh abruptly because of that, and like um. We talked earlier about how nobody really did the thing of looking at like a calling and a mm. class and wanting to and just mashing those together and making a character out of it. But that's what I did with Hazard. Right. Um, it like I, I knew the Incarnadine had some cool moves. That's what kind of got me like right. drawn to that. And then I started trying to figure things out until I think you sent me the Iker Drowned book. Um, and it had the retribution calling, and that was when I was right. like, "Oh, that's a really easy way to get a character into something halfway through." Yeah. Um, especially when, like, my idea was that like Hazard would eventually like hire the group instead of just hanging around while they fell apart, but like it works out either way. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it just it seemed like a really easy like singular motivation to get a character that like could Late in branch out into more stuff, but like. Yeah, it was tied enough to to things that we'd already established. It was just kind. Of, it just kind of worked out in a very happy way. And then, have I? I don't think I've done the mid season shift before. I don't. I think this is the first time I've done it. Um, I think so. It's not it's that not- hard. <laughs> wow! Damn! Wow! Called out. <laughs> I was gonna say though, Sylvie, you're kind of a pro at this, right? Because you, you're <laughs> the one of us who makes backup characters. Uh, That's just because I like making OCs. I'm just I'm a part of the deviant art generation, baby. <laughs> <laughs> when I lose characters midway through a season, I'm like, fucking Christ, who's who's gonna show up now? Yeah. Um, well, but I go ahead. No, I don't know. Was it? Did you find that your experience in being like, I I I've already got someone in the back pocket. 
made it well easier. it wasn't so i didn't really have someone in the back pocket i had like other ideas for characters that virtue almost was that i like mm. picked and chose um the decapitation thing linking both my characters a uh, kind of obviously is a mm-hmm. thing there but like the whole like having the, the the head stolen and like trying to hunt that down was a flip of a thing i was going to do with a different class that i'm not talking about in specific because i still might use that idea for something. yeah you can always come back around to it right yeah um but yeah it 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 it, i think something that helped too with doing it was that we kind of had figured out the world of samphiel more by the time i was doing it with hazard like it was stuff was established i wasn't like i didn't have as many like possibilities in mind in a weird way while also having the possibilities that were there way more focused um like we had found, I think we had pretty recently, because isn't isn't it like Bell Metal and then we go to Sapodia? Sapodia right after that, yeah. Like yeah. we very recently found out about the rights, and that was like such an easy in to sort of yeah. tie Hazard to what yeah. is what I considered sort of the main plot of the season, which then helped in a lot helped of ways. cement it as a main plot, right? Because I was like, oh, now yeah. I have a character who cares about this in a very direct, uh, uh, you know, um what's the what are they a calling related way and so mm-hmm. like that helps cement it uh yeah in, in a way which is nice but yeah so much of hazard was situational the card shark thing that just came because you mentioned the book the, or not the book the, the boat, boat yeah. e-words they're hard mm-hmm. um uh you, that just kind of i was like oh i wanted hazard to have something that i think i mentioned like i wanted them to like have something that they played with like fidgeted with or like Right. some element of chance and with cards came and right they, there yeah it was perfect yeah and you were like they're gonna be on this boat how about cards and the boom. rest is history boom um yeah true false war I, champion I don't know if I have, yeah as dealer not champion you you i mean no we not. never got to see yeah, hazard so. actually we never got to see the king of card games you know yeah i feel you <laughs> damn true a great yeah. opportunity to announce that oh. duval is retiring oh as, okay <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I just remember another moment I love, which is the confrontation with Ris- with Visco Riscano- or Uno Riscano, uh in uh, in the the showers of the slaughterhouse. Between uh, that's just <sighs> such a funny, fucked up little fight and encounter. Oh. That is like when I figured out who Hazard was too. Yeah, like yeah. that specific scene, I was like, oh, okay, this this guy's a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Uh, all right, we're going to keep moving. Uh, mm-hmm. Allie, can you read this one? From Bane. Um, yeah, from Bane. Hi there. St. Peel and Hyron both take place in fantasy worlds, albeit quite different flavors of fantasy. Were there any points where it was difficult to avoid retreading old ground since, there were, since the genres were more similar to one another than the sci-fi world of the Divine Cycle? Or was it easy enough given the different world building and systems? I think it kept happening. At the end, it kept happening, which is very funny to me. The fucking arts game where arts uh, finale, the Duval wanders into a god's forge. It's like, <laughs> all right, well, here we are. Um, uh, but, I, but I also think it's worth saying just outright that like, there was a point at which we were like, oh, is Sanfiel going to be a sequel to Hyron? And like some of the... I think some of the ghostly overlaps between the two are echoes of that being one of the places where we started was like, we would love to do a show. That's a, that's a deep distant follow up to high rod. That could be a fun thing to do. And we ended up going away from that. Um, but I think that there are many echoes of it still. Uh, and I think that that's a fun, you know, I think we managed to do the thing I love, which is that dark souls is not a sequel to demon souls. It just isn't. And yet, it's fun to think about how the two can be connected, right? Um, And I think that happens a lot this season. uh, And I think it happened... There there are ways in which I'm happy to play with it and evoke it without it being true. Um, uh, But but what I think is really important is the end of of S's um, uh, finale is like, you know, we basically say, like, whatever this world was before, it's Sanfiel now, right? So I think even if you read this whole world as being a Hyron 2 in some way um uh it isn't anymore right or it's just it's it has its own identity and i think there are points at which i was very afraid of that overlap 
and very interested in pulling the trigger and saying, ooh, I know we said we weren't going to do it, but what if we did it? What if we did it finally? And we, you know, I was like, one of the first um, images I had of this years ago was like, uh, when it was still more bloodborne y and maybe you were all going to be like master's students in, I don't like thaumaturgy or whatever, it was like someone picking up a locket and seeing a character from from Hyron in it, right? And like we decided, and I think correctly, we never want to do it like that, right? We never want it to be, boom, here is the one to one direct thing, right? Um, uh, but I think there's lots of fun echoes of it. Like my favorite one, I, I, this is a funny thing is like, I feel like talking about it takes the power out of it because it means we can never use it as a punch. And so I'm happy to talk about it, but like the, the, uh, three faced God of death and fire in, in oh, the triadic yeah. pyre is very easy to read as a trio of characters who had death as a central pivot point. Right. Mm. Except that our version of them is the god of lightning the goddess of lightning an instant justice like okay i could kind of work with that the smiling yeah. god of death Ooh, okay i can see where Ooh, the smiling god of death very interesting mm -hmm. and then a big mm -hmm. fuck off train <laughs> and it's just like okay well that just doesn't map one to one with three except for the code. fact that they're still a polycule they are still a polycule right, right of right, course right. and so yeah. in that way it still works but like it doesn't work and to me that's so much more interesting than yeah. if it didn't do you know what i mean like um again like i part of me likes talking about this because it takes the it it changes it but like you can straight up read the godly duel uh that marin walks into as like a complete follow-on to the end of spring and hyron to the epilogues of spring and hyron you can totally decode what's happening there I'm like, I don't know that it even happened. Who could say? It doesn't matter, like, you know? I want to be as clear as possible. We are not telling you, the listener, that that is what it is. No, this it is isn't. Not I'm in fact telling saying. you it isn't that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm doing it because it prevents me from ever saying it is. Do you know what I mean? And more importantly, even if that was your reading, the end of San Fiel un like, undoes it in a real way because right. the 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 strangeness the truth of the heartland seeps out and covers the world right it completely like rewrites the entire world into being sans fiel um, we've talked about and gone in and out of this idea so much totally that r right now is the only time i've ever felt sure one way or the other what the fuck sans fiel is and that's why i wanted to pull the trigger <laughs> on it that's why i was like let's answer this question because it's going to force us to say it and it'll take it off the table in a way right i the also important, should, oh. yeah art you so, should say your thing you should yeah yeah go go, go keith you no mine is a joke so oh, keith should go. keith should go okay yeah. um i i uh i you started talking about this and i was like is this a fake? Is this a head fake? Like I, I genuinely don't know. Like, are you doing a head fake? Are you? Is this about to? Is this about to set some rug pull for next season, or is this real? Did you finally decide? Don't say rug pull. And People are gonna think we're getting into NFTs. We're not. <laughs> I know that Redpool predates NFTs. I'm not. We are gonna get into Ponzi schemes, though. <laughs> just so, general. Um, just send us some money, and we'll keep it. <laughs> yeah, we don't know what a Ponzi scheme right, is. We do that we now. It's called one. running a business. It's our Patreon. We're already taking money from people. Um, but no, yeah. So the important two important takeaways here. One, yeah. Sonic Fiel is not a direct sequel to Hyron. Yes. Two, it is a direct sequel to Demon Souls. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The yeah, fog has spread out. A fair bit, but yes. yeah. Boletaria and Aldomina are very close, and, and the fog is the seeping in. And we did get the rights from Sony. Actually, we did. We made a big trade. A big trade. Uh, what do we I have? Thought you meant the rights of the Seventh Son. Oh, <laughs> oh. boo! Oh, I was um, so confused. I was like, "Wait, were they in Demon Souls?" I mean, Art, do you want to say what the very first idea of Duval was? Oh yeah the 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 Duval is a jar of bees. The Duval yeah. is the heat in the dark oh. made into a person. Yeah. Um, and there's still again there are good. still ways you could make that read i love it it's so good but it's also the opposite like the structure being it can't be right because you're actually from the structure but you are a jar right. of bees you know <laughs> um and we yeah that the, yeah duval was gonna be like a conduit for the heat in the dark as like a before thing a primordial force and it just didn't work out it just doesn't work right you know yeah. um uh but i i love i love imagining a world in which there are lore videos 
from fucking Vati being like, mm. you know, <laughs> ah. Vati, please listen to our show. Oh god. my god. <laughs> We'll start writing item descriptions, I promise. We will. We'll get there. <laughs> we used to do, you know, I think our, our intros used to have the item description quality to them, in a, in a sense. The tracks in Sangfiel all have a little yes, description. This is true. feel like item descriptions. This is true. This um, Venn diagram, you know, with with Hiron was something I thought about a lot in mm -hmm. the music in the back half of the season. I don't think I talked to you about well, this. We talked about it right away because you wanted to use a clarinet. And I was like, Jack, you can't use oh, a clarinet this and, season. And then, Austin, do you remember who added the clarinet back? Was it me? It was you. Fuck. You, I actually have a, a message from you uh, somewhere in which you say, Jack, I hate to be the one saying it, but I think we need the clarinet back. Was it for Sapodilla? No, was it, it was for? for the theme. Oh, the main theme. Oh, yeah. because you had done a version of it with the clarinet, and I was like, oh, we can't use this clarinet. And then I was like, I miss the clarinet. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, but uh, the the big thing for me was like, I have I have absolutely no interest ever in being like the twist is that it's in higher on right. here comes right. the higher on theme. Yes, I I couldn't. What think a disservice of a way... we would do to all of these characters to make them just a uh, a conduit for higher on. It's the work we've done making higher totally. You know, totally. saying now we're going to come back at it in a weird way. But something I did do was play with uh, uh, themes and tones that yes. I knew would yes. resonate in certain ways to listeners. Yes. Such that the, the biggest one for me was all the stuff surrounding the course and the stuff surrounding Chine dying. Mm. I wanted to I wanted to carry a similar feel that we often heard associated with like being welcomed into the arms of a god in high. Right, sure. Um, I'm thinking of stuff like the warmth of love, where there is, there's this sort of like keening, welcoming feeling, where even in the in the midst of this chaos, there is a there is a, a warmth and a comfort that can be found. And I did that less because I was going, oh, and it's actually all about Semethys or whatever, <laughs> and more because I'm like, <laughs> this is the audio language of the show, of the that, show. That, right. that we have set up, yep. and this is a way to talk about this feeling that I know will, whether or not it it is directly visible to listeners will be legible to listeners yep. in one way or another. We think about this all the, this stuff all the time. Like I, you know, um, Sapodilla is very clearly a, a strange echo of Marielda. Um, uh, I think that there's stuff like that throughout, uh, you know, in terms of down or, or of Velis, right? Like it, in my mind, the map of Sapodilla actually looks a lot like the map of Velis in my head because it's a seaside town with these like strangely named districts and, and you, you build out from there. Uh, and there are times this season where I've been like writing in that direction. I'm like, Oh no, I can't, this is, this is too far. This isn't, this is like corny actually. And I, I will stop doing it. And there are other times when I'm like, Oh, that's really fun. But the stuff I ended up really loving about this season was like, the my again if we talk about marrow creek is what's probably with some caveats one of my favorite arcs coming out of the mirage uh fallout not twilight mirage Th that's a line that i have no interest in crossing by the way the divine cycle to either of our fantasy seasons or series i have like that doesn't excite me in any way that i think is just fully corny <laughs> whereas this stuff i think is kind of like fun to think about even if it's not true um the uh the um, Marrow Creek first shows up in interviews at, at the gates of Sapodilla as this town that keeps recurring in my mind very like I can see the coloring of the ground and the dust and the, the fountain that shows up in Sylvie's uh, in, in uh, Virtue's uh, interview uh, in Marn's interview and I want to say in Likes also yep. Um, yep. And I was like, "Is this a real place?" And then we joke about it being a real place, and then I'm like, "Oh, it's a real place." And it, but and also, you're not in the real version of the real place. That to me is so much more interesting than anything we would ever do. That is like, and actually, it's rose marrow, or actually, it's da da da, and like that's fine. It's funny because but... the fake version of the real place was kind of scary, but the real version of the real place sounded kind of scary too. Yeah, I mean, it's a scary place. Yeah, totally. I mean, did you end up going? Is that where you ended up going? You went to the real version of the real place, or you end up going to the fake version of the real place? We don't know. We don't, don't know. We, know. we don't think we know. Yeah, hundred percent. Anyway, if that's wrong and we do know, then I apologize. Yeah, I who could I don't say? think we know. No one knows. All right, I'm gonna keep moving. Uh, Keith, can you read this from Brendan? From Brendan, yes, I can. Um, hi, friends. While listening to this season, I was completely captivated by Dire Ode, a person whom we heard on the cast only a few times, yet who we know has great importance to the way the story unfolded. Austin is incredibly good at creating and writing these types of people. I was wondering what the cast thinks of Dire Ode, and more specifically, what caused S to inquire Dire Ode 
uh, every time they showed up? Or was Austin playing it in such a way that intentionally steered her in that direction? Janine? Um, so the, the last part of this is what makes me laugh. The, it was Austin playing it in such a way that intentionally steered, her, steered me in that direction. <laughs> I, like, whenever we were just, like, chatting about how things should go on Discord or something... I brought Dyer up what feels like constantly because mm -hmm. I wanted to make it very clear to Austin that I was interested in seeing more of this character. <laughs> and that I specifically was like, I want to say quietly shipping, but like not so Ooh, quietly not shipping. Not quiet at all. Are you kidding me? Um, I mean, I guess we no. talk more often, but still. Yes. Yeah. And also, I like, didn't pick you, up on it. You, <laughs> you never do. <laughs> <laughs> you, wow! I'm not being just. That's not the way Keith it's engages true. with these stories. That's just not. You also, you know, Austin. You know, like my type. Like you yes, know I do. how. Even if you don't, even if you don't, I don't know if you deliberately set out to make a character that would appeal to me. Uh -huh. But I think it becomes immediately clear when a character has appealed to me. Um, and I wasn't. I knew what I was doing. Like, hey, by the way, this character appeals to me. Uh huh. Um, and that it was so. It was just. It was just that. It's sometimes it can just be that. <laughs> sometimes you can be into a character and be like, "Hey, how about that guy shows uh -huh. up?" Yeah. Works. Yes, a hundred percent. No, I, I think that was like. I wish they had had more time together. But the part of the thing that's tough is that like, Dyer's mystique is about being the sort of person who's off doing their own thing right yeah he has to shows roll up when you least expect exactly he has to like, roll up in the middle of your terrifying i'm trying to rescue our friend from the authoritarian fascist magic cop prison and be like actually i'll pay you if you go down there and get something after you do that and then i'll reward you mm -hmm. with a fancy cloak you know yeah. um <laughs> uh, i have gifts for you it has to be you know that has to be out of nowhere uh, for it to work and so he, he he was not someone who could just be around right i did think about having having them on the jade moon and then i was like ah we just got dire uh, that would be fun to have an opportunity to have more scenes with people and especially with s but dire is dire's going over the mountains to go deal with some stuff over there dire's prepping for this big thing tell you, know? you one thing about dire road <laughs> say this is what i mean this is yeah it's fine I do regret that we didn't get more brunch chatter. That's fair. Or more yes. like bre breakfast, brunch, lunch chatter at the ve at the very very end there. Yeah. I think I was I was more. Uh, it was a little unclear how much we wanted from those scenes. Um, yeah. So I think if I had known, I might have like languished in a little bit more. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's fair. Well, we could just say they did. It's a shame that we didn't get to record that, but. You know, I'm sure they had they had a great time on their way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're gonna only do a couple more now as we uh, as we wrap up. Uh, we are running out of time. People have hard outs, uh, but I want to get a couple more in here before we before we finish. Um, uh, here is one from Tara who says. This is the first year I followed Friends at the Table, so I may have missed past discussions on social media, but after catching up on previous seasons, it seems like Sanfiel has had the most uncertainty about where it would end. What influenced <laughs> that? I'm going to actually roll this in with another question from Matthias, who says, besides Heart of the City Beneath, what other games do you think could work well in a Sanfiel slash Conchenta setting? Were there other games that you considered besides Heart before settling on Heart? Because those are two of the same question, IMO, effectively. Um, what happened? I mean, like, from a broad perspective, um, there's a lot of moments, and this does happen every season, where I'm like, I don't, I think the, se the season is over. I think famously, I think I said that after the Kingdom game in Counterweight, or maybe one arc thereafter. Um, it would have been weird in retrospect. Well, we would have done counter Counterweight Season 2 the way we did Chiron, right? And that would have been a longer, mm. longer season than what followed, right? And so... Um, it would be a different world, certainly. Like we would live in a different world because who knows if, if we would maybe we would have just finished up counterweight last season. You know, it's totally possible that that would have happened. Um, Damn, it's a weird world to think about. But I really didn't know how we were going to end the season, coming off of Sapodia and Jade Moon, and was like, I think we're going to come back and have this confrontation with the magistrates and maybe with Alloway, and that'll be it. And then, of course, then Marrow Creek happened. And then we had to get the, those characters back to, to Blackwick, which meant that the, their travel had to happen. And so that meant there had to be a lead-in arc with the people who had already gotten back there. So we got Just Returns. 
and then we had to have the fallout from stuff going bad with Alloway, or like mostly it being about stopping the magistrates and Alloway gets to win. And then was the real who the hell knows what we're doing. I think we've talked, this is the most we've talked about what the fuck are we doing at the end of a season ever, 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 ever. Um, it just did not. Although it seems like it, it, it is harder every time, <laughs> at least for the last, uh, partisan was partisan this hard. It was, it was the second hardest, I think. Right. Harder than spring. Uh, oh, okay. Spring. <laughs> spring. <laughs> And we did. I think spring was way easier than this, but that's retrospective, right? Yeah. Um, um, we originally were like, oh my god, we originally I like we did the longest season in the world, and it was really easy to come to an end because we had done so much, and then no one wants to do a season as long as Twilight Mirage again, and we end up with like things that we still want to huh. do, but also not wanting to go for 60 episodes. Yeah, I mean, again, the contrast between this and like a high run season where it's like 30 episodes and we just know we're going to not get as much in is very interesting, right? Uh, but, so, we get to... We get we deal with... Uh, everyone escapes from Alloway, right? I think this is really the moment of like, okay, what's going to happen, right? Everyone escapes from Alloway, Everyone gets back together. Alloway is going to go off and do something to become super powerful, right? Alloway is going to go do the the great big uh, uh, ritual. At this point, it's like it's like capital R ritual. I have not figured out the incredibly scored by Jack scene of Alloway stomping around eating a heart live. <laughs> um, I've not figured out what that looks like yet. I've built the areas out in my mind and on paper, but I haven't like figured out what confronting Alloway looks like. What I what we end up doing is having a bunch of conversations off mic that are like, do we do two arcs where one of us goes to one group goes to Altaposqua for help and one group actually let's zero back. The first thing we have the conversation around is is Alloway a good villain or not? Is Alloway worth keeping for next season? Because if so, Alloway can just abscond with whatever it is that he needs or wants, and then we can just deal with that later, and we don't have to have a big final confrontation because you've escaped, and that means we can come back to Alloway. Um, but if not, we have to deal with Alloway, and that means Al and Alloway has like positioned, has gotten into a position of very big strength in terms of being ready to leverage the power of this place, the vein of the Mother Beast and all of that, to to become a god. Um, and that's the thing that I have to treat seriously because gods are serious in this world and we have to treat them, treat it, you know, like, a, like, Hey, this is a real threat to deal with. Um, but it seemed like, I mean, we had sessions where it was like, okay, we're going to record on Saturday. And we tweeted about like, all right, I think you were like this Saturday, we're going to finish San Fiel. And then that turned into just a call to talk about San Fiel's ending and not about recording it at all. And at this point, I want to be clear, the circus stuff hadn't happened yet. None of that had happened yet. And in fact, at that point, I was like, I'm going to punt on this because I want to make sure that's a full arc of its own that like, gets to breathe and it's not just like a rushed final downtime before you go confront Alloway. Um, and then finally, we're like, okay, we're going to finish this Alloway arc and it's going to be that one group go, we're going to decide. Uh, we, this just happened naturally. It was like, okay, one group's going to go to talk to Alta Pascua. One group is going to go. What was the other group going to go do? Does anybody remember what the other half was going to be? We briefly pitched a train chase that we were excited about for like, chase. so there was yes, a point at which we gonna... were coming up with yes. ideas so fast and discarding them so fast yes. that we were just like, Ugh. is it this? Oh, are we doing a bit with a load of birds now? No, 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 no. Right. right. <laughs> Did we already mention the, the skeleton queen we were going to do? Did that yeah, already... yeah, yeah, the underwater oh, skeleton queen out the oh, Pasqua. Oh, shit, we... We got stuck in this horrible hole where we were like, okay, listen, we need to, <laughs> we need to put Alloway in some oh kind of God. container. Yeah, we have to and then we right. need to yes. take the container somewhere oh. and destroy it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we had bits of the plan where we were like, we're uh -huh. going to take the container down to Alta Pascua. No, okay, we're going to throw that out. We're going to take the container on a train. Yeah, okay, but then why are we putting him in a container? And where do you get the <laughs> container from? Uh -huh. If you've ever seen the thing from the old Adam West Batman movie where he's running around with that bomb and can't find a place yeah. to throw it, that, that was the conversation. Exactly that was that dead was ass like, the plan. There was like, I was like, well, what are you going to do with this thing? Like, you're, well, it's not, what do you do? 
And also, where do you get something strong enough to contain Aloe? Yeah. I'm still we bummed because I had the perfect gift for her to, to like, oh, the Pasco, yeah, like right. perfect. It was, oh, just, yeah. it was just perfect. It was just like a thing of like, oh, this is amazing. She's going to love this. It's all lining up, baby. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then it just did, no. Anyway, and then what happened is, like, did not stay below the, the, like, went to grab the heart. And everything spiraled from there. And everybody was like, oh, my God, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened instead? Well, we what happened recorded, instead was like, better, but yeah, well, it's <laughs> like, but it specifically wasn't that we decided not no, to do. No, of those course, things. this is what I'm saying. We decided to do them, and then like was like, I bet I can get the heart. I bet I can just win this by taking the heart. And if I have the it was heart, so good. And you, you pushed the, your luck, and I but said. But then we went back to hell again, right? Because we were like, now. Yes. So again, yes. We yes. Sent, Pikmin and Like oh. went up to Alloway as step one of a plan that we didn't know. At Classic Friends at the Table. Not just like in production, we had no idea what was going to happen, but we were like, okay, it's probably good to get this confrontation in the camp. Yes. And we went up there, and then it all went to hell. And we had like two hours of really good friends at the table. So we were like, okay, Christ. So this <laughs> stays. <laughs> <laughs> we like this. Now do we cut do we all do? those other conversations about these other missions that are now not missions we're going to go on? Because why the fuck would we go? We it's not happening now because Alloway has uh, has the the heart and has Terra call. This is now a different situation. So we're not going to go talk to Alta Pasqua or the train chase, which I don't even remember what the train chase was for. That was getting. Uh, we the thought container. that we could destroy. We could we could put. Alloway in the train, or we could destroy the thing in the train. Sure. One of the, one Allie, of the, I don't remember you, this. Had you tweeted stay away from numbers and dates at this point, or was that <laughs> way in the future? No. no. I, I tweeted that around the vignettes time. Oh, yeah. Because it was when, like... <laughs> Oh, I don't. Oh because my God! Was, I hadn't even thought about was, the vignettes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, because it was like the the conver the conversation that you're talking about with like Pikmin and um, Alloway was like two hours. Yes. So it was like, that's definitely going to be a whole episode. Yes. And there's going to be more episodes. And it was like, don't say anything. Yes. Well, because then <laughs> we were nobody like, nobody knows. <laughs> then we were like, let's do a final farewell. <laughs> we'll do, we'll do the circus comes to, I, I told Allie and Jack, I didn't want to do the Circus Comes to Town. I was like, I have this whole thing planned, the Carnival of Moated Light, but this is just like not the way I wanted to do it. Like, I wanted to do it big, and this isn't going to be big. You can't do a whole session here at this point. We had to do like a whole arc here. We can only really do the, the downtime, and then from there, we have to kind of go into Denouement, and that's the end of the season, and that's not, that's a bad way to go out on. Um, you know, we talked about like, oh, we want to do kind of a festival. We want to like build into the festival of of like looping back around to the ground itself and it's been a year since that happens and blah 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 you remember we end with the the festival getting there or the the carnival getting there and then the big the big um fruit falling and it's all fucked up inside uh and so like even at that point we didn't really know and then even when we had we had the fed the the carnival recorded we didn't know what the what happened next and a big part of that is I have no fucking clue what Safiel season two is. I think I'm in a better place with it than I was at the time. Um, uh, I, you know, there was a leading game that we might play, um, but I'm not. I wouldn't put my name next to it. I wouldn't say that that's the game we're going to play at this point. Um, but for me, when we end a season, I like to know. This is how stories work. Um, you, you know, you you want to you want to foreshadow things. You want to set things up uh, before we even did this part. Before we even got to uh, Blackwood groups about to get fired, the big conversation was, are y'all going to be like teammates after this? Are you going to work together? Because if so, we should set things up for a game like, and I'm just going to read the whole list of games we've considered. I'm just going to read the whole list really quick. Some of these, some of these, uh, you know, I'll read them from, here's the ones that we were considering besides Heart last, like before we started this. We had considered Beneath a Cursed Moon, which is a Powered by the Apocalypse sort of uh, Castlevania-themed game. Um, uh, Legacy, Life in the Ruins, and then some variations thereof. There's lots of variations on Legacy, Life in the Ruins. A much different game that is very, very factional. Very much zoom out, talk about factions, zoom in, talk about individual characters. Songs for the Dusk, 
uh, a game that is a little more science fantasy, but that has lots of great community building rules, lots of interesting stuff around exploration. You know, it's a, it's a Forge in the Dark sort of um, and science fantasy destiny ish. Maybe some parts of Twilight Mirage you could you could imagine like the ground game of Twilight Mirage you could do in Songs for the Dusk. Um, uh, and then from this original set. Um, I guess we probably talked about and then dismissed Blades in the dark basically immediately. Uh, but Blades still I think in the that mix. actually stuck around for a while. Okay, well, so so, like, so why don't so we do Blades when we come right? Yeah, you're. I think you're totally right. <laughs> so then now looking at the finale and uh, being like, well, what do we want to do next season? That list is Songs for the Dusk, Blades in the Dark, Legacy, Life in the Ruins, Beneath the Cursed Moon, Brinkwood, Fellowship, Voidheart Symphony, Unknown Armies, The Between, Spire, Chamber. <sighs> Miserable Secrets, Court of Blades, External Containment Bureau, and City of Mist. And I don't know that any of them are right. I actually truly look at this list and I'm like, ah, I don't know. Um, and I think you could do Sanfiel and Conchentis games in basically any of them. But I don't know for various reasons that it's, we don't have the time to get into if any of them are right for what for what we did this season or for what we would want to do next season, right? Um, uh, and so... Uh, uh, and don't pick your favorite and start advocating for it. People who like start DMing me, you should do this one. You're only going to discredit the game that you want done. Like it's only going to be an annoyance that makes me not want to do it. So just like let us arrive at it ourselves. It'll probably be something not even on this list. Who knows? Um, uh, and the for me, ne we needed to come up with at least a general direction around: Are these characters remaining tight coworkers at the end of this, or are they going their separate ways? Uh, and if so what sort answered. of yeah answered <laughs> and if so what sort of regardless what sort of world state do we need to support a season in various things here right um uh, uh and i actually think the world state we're in still supports most of these games right um but like the spire pitch was like oh we could do spire and zevenzolia and we decided we don't want to do we don't want to do a resistance game for sanfiel 2 and we don't want to do Spire. Uh, we don't want to do a Zevenzolia specific game at this point. Who knows? Maybe six months from now, I have a great idea for a Zevenzolia game where somebody else does, and we end up all getting excited about it, and we do it. We find a game that would do it, and so we do it. Um, uh, but this was truly like the long night of the soul for me. <laughs> like losing sleep for weeks over not knowing how to end Sanfiel because I don't know what Sanfiel 2 is feeling super separated from the fan response from this game and the way that Dre was talking about before where like Dre you were saying that like you would see people get hyped on Chine and you were like yeah Chine that is how I feel how's how I felt about Sanfiel until we were done Sanfiel right you know um uh her really okay sure um because it's like I was not I was so tortured over not knowing how to end this thing and so finally, we make a decision, a, a tentative decision on a, a, the kind of world state we're hoping for. We do what I think is a really great finale, uh, uh, or, or you know, proto finale, pre finale with uh, uh, down, done in the dust, down in the dust, dusted and dead. What's the actual name of that final arc? Dead in the dust. And then we do the, and then we realize that we could do the vignettes. And of course, I pitch these as what else? I think they'll just be like twenty minute little little vignettes mm, yeah. between between me and one other player. We'll just like knock I'm them out really quick. Of doing this year of Oz again, little just like little abstract, you know, delves, whatever. Maybe thirty minutes all said. Yeah, I'll have to explain the rules. Three characters per episode. Three characters per episode. Bop bop bop. Bop 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 bop. Done. I think it's worth saying. Guess, alongside this, I had like created a um a like spreadsheet calendar of yes. like hey jack and oh austin let's oh, just yeah. talk about when palisade is gonna start because i feel like we should know this and like the just the feeling of like being like oh i want to finish saying fiel so i could like clean my apartment yeah and then saying fiel just becomes uh, just seven weeks going. longer like overnight and i'm just like everybody has to stop talking about how you long saying fiel is you are, <laughs> yes God. publicly and you have to understand that like the first time the joker hit like oh that's kind of cool <laughs> That's neat how that's oh, going to turn this from a 50-minute yeah. episode to a two-hour episode. Um, <laughs> I think that happened... That was... I that drew was the you. first joke. was art. Right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. And uh, I had what I thought was a really out-there idea with, let's bring in someone who's not on this episode. And then, like, the other two <laughs> jokers were like... Really made me look like I wasn't reaching hard enough with the joker. You reached exactly as hard. You, brought the, you made the right choice. It was... 
it was o- and it was only because I knew what you did for your Joker that I knew what right to right go harder we, than yes ex- exactly. <laughs> You set a bar. You set a high bar, Art, and then we had to clear that bar twice. And all the Jokers hit before we got through a single thing. None of the Jokers are on turns two or three of the trip. They're all the by the first turn of the oh. trip. All of them. All three I, of I them. Would, I wouldn't have done it any other way, though. No, it's great. It's fantastic. Some of the best material <laughs> we've made. Fantastic. Love Think it. Think if you'd done a third of it, and then you'd had to do a two and a half hour. Oh. It would, honestly, it wouldn't, wouldn't have done it. felt... Because, well, no, I think we, we would have, because else. it was, oh, it ended up being three hours even without it. So it was like, oh, it was three hours and 20 minutes, like, you know, what even What's is the that? difference? Yeah, we're, we're past that now on the fucking postmortem. So, <laughs> so that's it. That's what happened. Um, mm-hmm. That's why it took so long. We don't know what Zombiel Season 2 is going to be. I have a loose idea, broadly, of a game I'd love to play. I don't know if we want to play it in Zombiel or not. Um, and again, it's going to be a while before we get there. Maybe something new that I want to play will come out and we'll, we'll play it, you know? Uh, I forgot but. that's what the question was. I'm really in the weeds on this. Yeah, it's because I went to this <laughs> Matthias one. All right. Last question. Comes in good one. from Bree. For each player, also Austin, if he wants to answer for an NPC, what is your character's gas station snack and beverage order? I think everyone thinks... Because of the way that he holds himself, Alicast orders a single black coffee. But actually, he's very excited to use their bad hot chocolate and cappuccino machine oh, in the back yeah. corner and get himself <laughs> something a little too sweet. And then he gets one of those little prepackaged cherry pies. Ooh. Oh. Nice. Do uh, y'all have single... this? Do, does everyone have, like, the thing they get at a gas station? Is this, like... A normal yeah. thing a person when I was has. A kid, not so much anymore, but like I, I you know. Yeah. If we were on a road trip, okay. From a scenario, these characters are on a road trip. Okay. The train yeah, stops, yeah, yeah. and they're yeah. at, and there's a what gas station get? there. What do they get? Mm-hmm. Uh, like, the gas well, pump. Like, the gas pump. <laughs> Put, you're lowering Turn the gas pump. So expensive. <laughs> lowering the gas pump and opening, like opening the <laughs> valve, so it could just like douse itself in the gasoline happily, drinking it as it comes in. Ah, oh, perfect. Sorry, go ahead, uh, Marn. Oh, I well, because I had such a strong reaction to this question. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the meme that's like. I have a little drink, girly. I love to <laughs> yes! go to a place yeah. and get a new yeah. drink. I love mm-hmm. drinking new drinks. Um, oh, it yeah. makes me happy. Marn and I was like, this is, is me. Marn, Marn is a little drink early. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, drink girlies rise up. Yeah. Uh-huh. Only way to be. Uh, Pikmin would have one black coffee uh, <laughs> and like a, um, just like a plain glazed donut. Hmm. Oh. And a single cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> this is a gas station that sells Lucy's. What? <laughs> Hazard is a beautiful place. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have one for Hazard and one for Virtue. For Hazard, it's I, I I guess it depends on if they have like a slushing machine there. I remember when I was a kid, some gas stations would, and just getting like every mm-hmm. flavor possible yes, in one. That makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. as well as uh, mystery flavor Airheads, because I think that's oh, a funny joke. Oh, that's a funny joke. Um, and Virtue would have the gas station attendant. Yes, good. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Great. Who are we missing? What do we got? We need we need Duval. We need a like. We need an S. Is that right? Yeah, I think Duval gets a cup of coffee, puts sugar in it, then sort of like walks away, then <laughs> comes back and puts sugar in it again, and then walks away and comes back and puts <laughs> sugar in it a third time until you're like, that truly must be the most disgusting <laughs> cup of coffee anyone's ever had. Anybody's uh, ever um, made. So you tell the yeah, answer in control that day. Uh huh. Um. Yeah, the inspiration for this is um, Men in Men Black. Men in Black, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. of yeah. course. Um, and for like, uh, I, I, mm, I, don't, I don't like this about, about him necessarily, but I think Duval eats a, a packaged sandwich. Like a, oh, yeah, like a he does. Sandwich. Um, and in real life, don't, don't do it. No. They're not good. No. Unless you're in the UK where they're very slightly better, but not much. Yeah. Uh, Bucho, I'm going to answer your second character. Bucho gets three hot dogs. One of them is only mustard. 
One of them is only ketchup. The third mm-hmm. one is everything they have available. He eats them in a particular <laughs> order. Yeah, and then he gets a big gulp. Order? Yeah, it's mustard first because it like yeah. spicy, it hits you. And then it's yeah. everything because uh-huh. that's the bulk of it. And then it's the ketchup. It's a little, it's a dessert hot dog because it's so sweet. <laughs> Mm. It's a dessert hot dog. Uh, and oh, then finally, uh, and then also it's a big gulp. It's a big gulp of Mountain Dew. No, it's probably not Mountain Dew. Uh, what's Bucho drink? What's what's the Bucho soft drink of choice? It's a big gulp of ice water. <laughs> <laughs> All the flavors in the food. All right, we still need an S, and we still need uh, yeah. a like. Um, I think for S, it's like. <sighs> It's got to be either like a pineapple crush or like a Tahitian treat uh, soda. Uh-huh. Um, like something really like sugary and, and fruity, but also like a little bit weird, like not just a plain orange or grape or whatever. Um, and uh, a pack of cinnamon toothpicks. And then <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel I feel like those the prepackaged like frosted the cup the chocolate cupcakes with the little swirl on top yes yeah 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 yeah. yes this is this is us to me why like him uh a bag of hot fries large peanut m&ms a king-size payday swedish fish the full-size bag (laughs) original flavor beef jerky four five dollar lottery tickets a raspberry iced tea a lemon iced tea two chocolate snack cakes and a thing of whole milk (laughs) i'm so glad oh that was exactly what i wanted uh yeah i think that's about Uh, just uh keith just write that down as d12 snacks haven (laughs) you could break it up later we'll deal with it yeah legendary snacks it's yeah uh uh-huh Oh my oh, god. Oh. All right. That is going to do it home. for us. We get to go home now. We've done this now for almost four hours. From four hours, if you count from before we started actually streaming. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for joining us for all of San Fiel. Uh, you can send questions for our tips and drawing maps uh, uh, show on Patreon to tips at the table at gmail.com. I feel like we'll run it as tips for a little bit still uh, between seasons. Um, so get some questions about running running games playing games tabletop games in general tips at the table at gmail.com um uh as always you can support us by going to friends at the table dot cash uh we'll be back with some stuff uh eventually we're gonna we are going to take a break in the main feed like there will be nothing in the feed for a minute um i suspect and then we'll probably be something in the feed just pulled from the patreon before we even get to putting uh the road to palisade in i have an idea but i want to clear it with with ali first <laughs> Um, uh, so I don't want to, I mean, you know, no, we'll clear it off mic. I don't want to make it. <laughs> well, I'll yeah. pitch you my idea right now, okay. which is we, uh, we just do unedited, improvised Palisade trailers every week. A different cast member <laughs> no. will just make up a whole trailer that has nothing to do with Allie what the season is actually going to no be. Time. Uh, yeah, like, I feel like that's just, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> we'll just find it on the way. We'll just figure it out as we get there. Yeah. Can I uh, can I plug an extra something real yes, quick? Yes, please. Now the is the latest time. latest episode of our Uru Let's Play. Ooh. Uh, you are just you. Went up, yes, you are you. Yeah. Yes, you mm-hmm. are you. Uh, uh, went up Damn yesterday. Me. It is the first part of two parts of one of the best things we ever put on the Run Button channel. So you should definitely watch it. It's wild. Uh, totally upends my opinion of what Uru is um, fully. So you should check out that. Uru is the weird live action sort of MMO mist game. Yes. It's not live action. It's not, not live, live action. Uh, like real, live like a ser- service? Uh, like a permanent, you know, like permanent game states is what I meant to say. Uh, like okay. a persistent oh, world. Oh, it has a persistent world. I see. I yeah. see. I see. Uh, Allie, I'll say it now. You want to say it now? Okay. You go say it? <laughs> You're go yeah, with it. Uh, we're going to put Mall Kids, uh, one of the funniest yes. uh, oh, games yeah. we've ever done in Bluff City. We'll just put all of Mall Kids in the main feed. Um, wow. It's so good. I know it's, it's so good. Are I you thought mad we at us? Put mall, mall Kids is more expensive that we should have <laughs> put Mall Kids Release. on its own Patreon. Cut out all the stuff with like the neighbor family and the doll and have that as like (laughs) a fifty dollar tier. Yeah, that's a DLC. (laughs) That's yeah, Yeah. you have to people who have not heard this arc, I think it's probably one of our funniest arcs. It's it's truly you have no idea where it's gonna go. 
Um, uh, it's so, so, so funny and good. Uh, so I hope people enjoy it. It's um, the bluff episode that feels the most like alive. alive the table. Yeah. And it's also a bluff episode that feels most like a season because of how long it is. <laughs> 10 hours or something total. It's absurd. <laughs> a little bit Marielle ask. Yeah. It's absurd. Yeah. That's, is that Young by the Shore? Is that what it is? No. Young mm. by the Shore. Is that right? Is that what it's called? No, because Young by the Shore is playground. It's America's playground. Young by the Shore is the intros by my character in America's playground. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Young by the Shore is. uh, Are you just remembering one of our bits, Keith? (laughs) Someone say one of the bits. I've never laughed as hard as something that happens in one of these bits in one of these episodes. So people should look forward to that. Oh, Uh, it's so funny. (laughs) Oh my god. So I had to not think too closely about it. It's so funny. Um, it all right. really like Bluff City made by weirdos more than usual. More than we were, re- we were really weirdos on that one. So look forward to that. Uh, I mean, we're all playing other things. If you like hearing me talk about role playing games, I was recently on uh, Game Study Study Buddies. Uh, Cameron and uh, uh, Michael invited me on to GSB to talk about uh, William White's. Uh, book about the forge, which is a extremely influential uh, and uh, somewhat maligned uh, form um, uh, forum uh, from the 2000s, in which a lot of the developers or the designers of games that that we ended up playing uh, were were part of that community. Uh, I think that conversation was very good, and if you need to fill a podcast hole, you can go listen to that episode. So uh, go listen to all their stuff. That's great. I'm behind on that, but that's a good show. Yeah. All right. I think that's it. Any other final plugs before we do a time that is and say goodbye to Sanfiel? I was gonna, but I don't know when it comes out, so it's fine. <laughs> Emoji Drone 2.0. Emoji Drone 2.0. Also, mm-hmm. I guess I'm gonna be on a JoJo podcast, Dogs Must Die with Chip and Ironica. Oh, yeah. some, like sometime next we recorded it, but I don't know the specifics of when it'll be released. It's about Golden Ironicus. Wind. I really like Golden Wind. Incredible. Chip and um, Ironicus were so just that's... on a Just King Things bonus pod to talk about the yeah. movie Thinner. So and we played one of Grant's games for the Road to Palisade. We did play, yeah. We totally did yeah. play one of when we played um, uh, Last Shooting. Last Shooting, of course, named for the Gundam yeah. sequence. Uh, a, a hack of final. Oh, yeah, bid. that's my last minute plug. Love it, <laughs> love it. All right, no more final bids or no more final plugs. Uh, time that is to do a clap. <clears throat> we good? We ready? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Fifteen seconds. Nice. That, that came good through time. really good. Yeah, I don't know if it was that actually good. That spooked me a little bit. I don't know what it was. But <laughs> it scared me. Mm-hmm. All right. That's going to do it, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, bye-bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.